A young woman on her way home is walking down a city street, and just like most nights, the downtown empties out after the working day ends, leaving the streets empty of both cars and pedestrians. She hates when she has to close the shop and walk to her bus stop alone, and she is excited that in just another week, she will be starting a new job that's just around the corner from where she lives. She just has to get through these last few nights of being the last one at the store and having to walk home alone. Her more immediate concern now, though, is that her music has stopped. The young woman takes her phone out to check it. Dead. She must have forgotten to plug in the charger. She hates when she does that. Now she'd have to spend the bus ride staring out the window at nothing. What was that? The woman looks up from her phone. Did she see someone? She turns around and sees something on the other side of the street. It's dark, and all she can make out is a big shadowy figure. She doesn't stare for long though, and starts to walk again, picking up her pace slightly. She can hear the sound of footsteps and glances over her shoulder. The person across the street is moving too, and they seem to be matching her pace, avoiding any streetlights to remain in darkness. She starts to move a little quicker, and so do they. The young woman grips the pepper spray in her pocket. She doesn't know what this person is doing or what they want, but she's going to be ready for them. She keeps walking and glances over her shoulder again. They're crossing the street towards her now. She ducks into an alley, and as soon as she's around the corner and out of sight, she starts to run. She sprints through the alley as fast as she can. She looks behind her, frightened of what she might see, but no one is there. Maybe she was wrong and they weren't following her, but she's not about to stop running and find out. She emerges from the alley still running as hard as she can. She reaches her bus stop and finally stops to catch her breath. She checks her watch. The bus should be pulling up right now, but it's nowhere to be seen. She looks around, and what she does see is a shadowy figure coming out of the alley, and it's coming straight towards her. She backs up into the bus stop and takes the pepper spray out of her pocket, her finger ready on the trigger. The shadowy figure keeps moving towards her when suddenly the dark street is lit up. The woman looks behind her to see her savior. It's the bus. She turns back to see the shadowy figure retreating to the alley as if the light is pushing it away. The woman breathes a sigh of relief and finally lets some of the tension in her body release as the bus comes to a stop in front of her. The door swings open and the woman steps inside. I've never been so happy to get on the bus, she says to the driver as she scans her transit card. The driver doesn't respond though. In fact, he doesn't react to her at all. He just keeps staring straight ahead. The woman doesn't push it though, she's just happy to be on the bus, even if it is completely empty. She heads to the back of the bus and takes a seat. As the bus pulls away, she can almost swear she could see the shadowy figure standing in the alley, watching her. The bus rumbles along the empty city streets as the woman looks out the window and takes deep breaths, trying to calm herself after her harrowing ordeal. After a while, she notices that the bus doesn't seem to be stopping as much as it normally does, or at all for that matter. Did they change the route? Or did she get on the wrong bus? They are approaching her stop though, so it doesn't matter, and she reaches up to pull the cord. A bell chimes and the stop requested light illuminates in the front of the bus, but the driver doesn't show any sign of stopping or even slowing down. She pulls the cord again, but still no reaction. As she sees her building go by, she calls out, hey, this is my stop, but the driver doesn't acknowledge her at all. She stands up and walks to the front. Didn't you hear me? This is my stop. Still no reaction from the driver. Hey, I said… She reaches out and grabs his shoulder, spinning him towards her, only to find herself staring into the eyes of a fresh corpse. The woman screams and jumps back as the driver slumps forward towards her. She's terrified by the dead body, as well as the fact that the bus will crash, but when she looks at the steering wheel, she sees that it is continuing to move on its own. The woman is in a full-blown panic now. She screams and pounds on the door, but it won't open. The engine roars as the bus starts to pick up speed. She doesn't know what to do and runs to the back where she tries the rear door, but it doesn't budge either. The bus speeds up even more, whipping around corners and tossing her from side to side. She's thrown to the ground and hits her head. Her eyelids feel like they weigh a hundred pounds and she struggles to keep them open. She manages to stay awake though, and as she looks up in a daze, staring at the ceiling of the bus, she can see a green gas emanating from the vents. It's the last thing she sees before her eyes close for good. The bus finally comes to a stop in a deserted area of the city. The vehicle raises slightly as, one after another, each wheel appears to unfold, revealing them to be long, black, spindly legs. 
The bus stands up on these insectoid appendages as its roof splits into two massive wings. The bus then leaps up into the sky, spreading its wings, and flies off into the night. How could this young woman have known that after escaping danger, that her rescuer would be something worse, much worse? Unfortunately for her, she had just willingly stepped onto an instance of SCP-2086, a deadly and terrifying anomaly that hides in plain sight as it stalks and hunts its human prey. SCP-2086 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a species that appears to belong to the arthropod phylum, a group that also includes arachnids and crustaceans. These strange creatures differ from most of their lobster and spider brethren in that they make use of an advanced form of camouflage to move among modern society unseen. Adult SCP-2086 instances all resemble some sort of public transportation vehicle, with the exact make, model, year, and branding varying from instance to instance. SCP-2086 instances move about the streets of our cities foraging for food, and at first glance, they are virtually indistinguishable from the standard transit vehicles they are mimicking. Close examination of them, though, will reveal that the steel, wood, plastic, and glass they are composed of aren't those materials at all but a form of specialized chitin, which is the substance that makes up the hard exoskeleton of many insects and other arthropods. And that's not the only aspect of SCP-2086 that isn't actually what it appears to be. The wheels on the bus may go round and round, but they also are capable of unraveling into long, thin legs that create a very imposing image when SCP-2086 is standing up at its full height. The roof, too, is able to unfurl into a set of giant insectoid wings, and after leaping into the air with its powerful legs, the wings will spread and the bus can take flight, which appears to be its preferred method of travel when it is not in its camouflaged hunting mode. Its headlights, too, are an entirely biological mechanism, consisting of two large bioluminescent optical organs similar to those possessed by SCP-015-IT and SCP-745. Dissections of SCP-2086 specimens have shown them to have an entire system of organs, including a heart, brain, and stomach, which are found beneath the flooring in the creature's interior chamber. SCP-2086 appendages are not just used for locomotion, though, and they have been observed as being able to use them for fine object manipulation. This fact was learned when they were observed building crude shelters from scrap materials at their nesting grounds. More on these nests and the terrifying events that take place there later. When SCP-2086 is not at its nest, it engages in its foraging behavior. Typically, an SCP-2086 instance will fly to the start of a route and begin driving along city streets, picking up human passengers who willingly enter the creature's inner chamber, thinking that it is a standard bus. Along with its exoskeleton closely resembling a real vehicle, SCP-2086 has one more particularly gruesome trick to fool would-be passengers into becoming its prey. A bus that drives itself would lead many to think twice about stepping on board, so SCP-2086 makes use of a decoy driver, which is actually a human corpse encased and preserved in a shellac-like substance. Smaller, fibrous appendages protrude from the front seat and into the corpse, which hold it in place and are even capable of manipulating the corpse giving it the appearance of movement as it drives the bus. Once SCP-2086 has gathered up what it considers to be enough victims, a number that appears to vary from instance to instance, it will release a noxious gas from its interior vents. The gas produces an effect in humans similar to chloroform, and everyone on board will be rendered unconscious. The creature, now filled with its prey, does not feed on the humans trapped inside it though. Instead, it will take them to its nesting grounds, which is where the real horror begins. These nesting grounds are most often localized in scrap and junkyards that have fallen into disuse or are completely abandoned, and it is in these nests that the juvenile instances of SCP-2086 are found. While a full-grown instance can weigh as much as 17,000 kilograms, which is the approximate curb weight of a normal bus, extensive field research and observation into SCP-2086 has led to the identification of the smaller, juvenile instances, which are much smaller than their adult counterparts, weighing under 200 kilograms. But they don't stay this size for long. When an adult SCP-2086 arrives back at the nest with its interior chamber filled with human prey, it will open its doors and allow the juvenile members to enter inside of it so they can feed and grow. Once inside, a juvenile will remove a passenger from the bus and take them outside. 
The effects of the chloroform gas will often begin to wear off at this time, but by this point, it is already too late. The juvenile instance will then proceed to force the human into a hole located under their hood. This leads to a sort of digestive tract that connects to its inner chamber where the driver's seat is located. Small, hair-like appendages will then emerge from the seat and protrude into the prey's body, which hold them in place in the driver's seat and trap them there, while at the same time acting as feeding tubes, draining the blood from the now-doomed passenger. Once the person has been completely drained of blood, the feeding tubes will begin secreting a saline solution as the internal compartment fills with a shellac-like substance, and the effects of both combine to effectively embalm and preserve the corpse, which will serve as its own decoy driver once it enters adulthood. And this process happens quite quickly. A newborn SCP-2086 will reach adulthood in just one week, provided that it has had access to nutrients at which point it will begin searching for new sources of prey for its own offspring, of which it will likely have plenty. 2086 instances become capable of reproduction at 8 days, and females are able to produce up to 20 offspring, but their lives are quite short, with their entire life cycle usually lasting just 12 to 15 days. Prior to feeding and beginning the process of becoming a full-size adult, juveniles will also leave the nest and will covertly move about the city, removing bus stop signposts and relocating them, often creating a route that leads back to its own nest. These are the routes that adult instances will then typically follow as they hunt for more prey to bring back to their colony. SCP-2086 instances have been found in metropolitan areas around the world, and news reports are closely monitored by the Foundation for missing persons that had recently used public transport, with Foundation field agents being dispatched to potential high-threat areas to investigate further. Any nests that are discovered have their locations condemned, if they weren't already, and demolished using chemical explosives. Previously, an effort was made to capture and contain live instances of SCP-2086, and currently the Foundation has five such specimens in its custody, which are stored in a converted airplane hangar. Due to their short lifespans and high rate of reproduction, the amount of live specimens contained at any given time can vary widely, and will often depend on the number of available D-Class personnel who can serve as drivers. Terminated specimens are either destroyed or sent to a specialized cold storage container at a secure site for further biological research. SCP-2086 continues to be one of the most dangerous anomalies for common, everyday users of public transportation, and the SCP Foundation has classified it as Keter. While identified colonies are able to be destroyed with minimal effort once discovered, there is no telling how many nesting grounds still remain in the wild. So the next time you're about to board a bus, pay extra careful attention to it. Or you may find that your bus is rerouting you somewhere you never wanted to go. A group of friends are driving down the highway late at night. They're on their way home from a concert, and after the long night of dancing and partying, all of them are feeling quite tired. The radio is turned off, and after so much loud music, the silence is refreshing. No one is talking at all, and in fact, the driver notices that both his girlfriend sitting next to him, as well as his friend in the back seat, have fallen asleep. The driver tries to make sure that he doesn't do the same as the car moves down the long stretch of straight, empty highway. The driver's eyes start to grow heavy, though. He can feel the weight of sleep starting to press on him. He turns the radio on at a low volume, but that only staves off the drowsiness for a moment. He can't fight the approach of sleep any longer, and his eyes start to close. As he drifts off to sleep, his foot presses down slightly more on the accelerator. The driver's head slumps to the side as the car gains speed and begins to pull to the right of where it crosses the white line, marking the edge of the highway. The tires dip off the road into the dirt, and the sudden change causes the driver to jerk back awake. He quickly swerves the car back onto the road. The sudden jolt causes both the passengers to wake up. Is everything okay? The driver tells them that he just swerved to… to avoid an animal in the road. That's right, nothing to be worried about. They can go back to sleep. As both of his friends close their eyes and try to go back to sleep, the driver spots something. Lights have appeared in his rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. He didn't notice a car pulling out or speeding up behind him, but he must have missed it when he was dozing off. His heart is still racing from when he drifted off the road, and he's trying to regain his composure, but it's about to get a whole lot harder, because when he looks in the mirror again, he sees that the telltale red and blue lights of a police cruiser have lit up behind him. Oh crap, oh no, oh no, the driver says out loud. Everyone is awake now and aware of the cop behind them. They grow nervous and start freaking out 
Not all the activities they had partaken in at the concert were, strictly speaking, technically legal in this state. What do we do? The driver asks. You've got to pull over, says his girlfriend. The cop car's sirens come on. This is serious. But then something strange happens. They hear a voice in the car, coming over the radio. It's too quiet to hear, but when the driver turns up the volume, the message comes through loud and clear. It's a gruff voice that keeps repeating the same phrase over and over. You better run. How is this message coming over the radio? They don't know, but the passenger in the back seat agrees with the voice. They've got to try and run. They have to get out of here. The driver's girlfriend is screaming to pull over. The cop car speeds up and is right behind them now, almost on their bumper. It's lights flashing and sirens blaring. The driver doesn't know what to do. Should he pull over? Should he try to run? Everyone is yelling. He starts to push down on the accelerator, but then thinks better of it. There's no way this old car can outrun a cop. Finally, he makes the decision to brake and starts to pull the car to the side of the road. The police car comes to a stop behind them. The sirens are off, but the bright lights are almost blinding. They sit in the car and await their fate. But nothing happens. The car is just sitting there behind them. After what feels like a long while, the door of the cop car finally opens. The three passengers watch silently as a highway patrol officer steps out and begins approaching their car. The driver tells everyone to relax, that this is going to be just fine, but the passenger in the back starts to panic. He can't get arrested. If he does, it will mean that he loses his scholarship. He'll get kicked out of school. His whole life will be over. The highway patrol officer reaches the car. Despite it being late at night, he's wearing dark aviator sunglasses that cover half of his face. He stands in front of the door to the car and waits. The driver, feeling nervous and afraid, rolls down his window. The police officer doesn't move or react, though. He just keeps standing next to the car. Um, good evening, officer, the driver says. No response. The driver turns and looks at his girlfriend in the front seat, but all she can do is shrug. He turns back to the highway patrolman. Did we do something wrong? There's another long pause, but then the patrolman finally reacts. He bends over and leans in close, sticking his head practically through the open window and putting his tight-lipped face right next to the driver's. Do you... do you want my license and registration? The driver asks. The patrolman doesn't respond. He reaches up and slowly grabs the side of his dark aviator sunglasses. He pulls them down, and the driver finds himself staring into a pair of bright, red, glowing eyes. Evil eyes. Everyone in the car starts to scream as the thing standing in front of them opens its own mouth to reveal a big, black, gaping hole with no gums or teeth, a horrifying void in its face that screams right back at them. As you may have already deduced, this was no normal traffic stop, and certainly not a normal highway patrol officer. No, the entity that this group of young adults encountered that evening was one that dozens before them had the same misfortune of running into, and one that the SCP Foundation is actively trying to stop from engaging in its frightening and dangerous behavior. This is SCP-973. SCP-973 is not one, but actually two separate entities. The first, designated SCP-973-1, is a police cruiser that appears to be a model similar to those used by actual state troopers during the early 1970s, and its condition is much like you would expect for a well-used, nearly 50-year-old vehicle, with much of it being in an advanced state of disrepair. Eyewitness accounts of SCP-973-1 have described the police car as having numerous dents on the doors and hood cracks in the windshield, multiple rust spots, and a rear bumper that looks to be held on with duct tape. The vehicle's driver and sole occupant has been designated SCP-973-2. This humanoid figure has an appearance that resembles a Caucasian male in his late 40s. It is dressed in a state trooper uniform that, like 973-1, also looks to have come from the early 1970s. And eyewitnesses have described him as being slightly overweight, balding, and sporting a handlebar mustache. Both the anomalous car and its driver will appear at night in a specific location along a particular U.S. highway. It is unknown exactly what will cause SCP-973 to show up on this road, but Foundation researchers have hypothesized that its manifestation may be triggered when a vehicle accelerates over a certain speed. You may think you're safe, then, if you stay below a certain speed, but unfortunately, you'd be wrong. 
It's unknown exactly what speed limit infraction will lead to SCP-973's appearance, with reports ranging from 35 miles per hour all the way to 70. But when it does occur, the driver will find that they are now a target. SCP-973 will materialize roughly half a kilometer behind the targeted vehicle and will approach them at a high rate of speed. SCP-973-1 sirens will turn on and its lights will flash, as it also somehow broadcasts a message into the targeted car that is picked up on the car's radio, a message that urges the driver to run, often accompanied by several expletives. In most cases, the targeted vehicle will abide by the instructions over the radio and begin to flee, though it's unlikely that this is due to any mimetic effect. Rather, it would seem that most run out of pure terror. SCP-973 will then pursue the targeted car, leading to a high-speed chase. No matter how fast the targeted car is, though, the SCP-973-1 police cruiser will always be faster. And it typically takes no more than six minutes for them to be overtaken. SCP-973 seems to have no qualms about ramming into the fleeing car, which likely accounts for the extreme damage present on the patrol car. While it is unclear exactly what happens once 973 forces the targeted vehicle to stop, either through their own choice or by being rammed off the road, the results are quite disturbing. The vehicle that fled will later be located somewhere near SCP-973's spawning location, usually within roughly 6 kilometers of the road. Whether the vehicles that are found that far from the road drove there in a panic or were somehow transported there by anomalous means isn't clear. What is clear is that the occupants of the cars met a truly grisly fate. Their bodies will show signs of extreme violence and assault, including evisceration, and some have been so badly maimed and mangled that visual identification was impossible. The vehicles themselves are badly damaged, showing signs of impact from another vehicle, and severe burn damage is often present in the interior. So far, over 34 individuals and 19 vehicles have been designated as victims of SCP-973, though it is likely that the true number is much, much higher. Perhaps most terrifying of all is that some of the victims survived. The Foundation has recovered five individuals from sites of SCP-973 attacks, who in addition to their gruesome physical injuries, also suffer from varying levels of ongoing mental trauma. But why not just destroy the road that SCP-973 appears on, you ask? Well, the Foundation had this same idea, and in 1983, the section of highway affected by SCP-973 was demolished, in an attempt to stop it from manifesting. This attempt failed, though. All this led to was SCP-973 changing its location, where it immediately began engaging in the same deadly behavior. Numerous attempts have also been made to try and capture both 973-1 and-2. In one such event, several teams of SCP Foundation containment specialists were dispatched to its section of highway with the mission to subdue and contain the anomaly. After multiple attempts to get SCP-973 to appear by driving down the highway at various speeds, a car carrying several agents was finally successful, and they spotted the flashing red and blue lights of 973-1 behind them as the message telling them to run began playing over the radio. With no further warnings, the anomalous police car closed in on them, even faster than the agents were expecting, and immediately began ramming into their car. A van filled with additional containment specialists was dispatched to the area to help, and when they reached the area that the GPS tracker on the pursued car led them to, they found that they were too late. SCP-973 had pushed the agent's car far off the road and was ruthlessly tearing their bodies apart. The arriving containment team immediately began firing on 973 in an attempt to save their fellow Foundation agents. The team's weapons appeared to cause some injuries to 973-2, showing that it is perhaps vulnerable to lasting damage just like the 973-1 vehicle is. In a post-mission interview, one of the agents described SCP-973's new appearance. His eyes were red, and his mouth, it was just a black hole. No teeth, no tongue, just a hole. No other reports would come from this incident, though, as this agent was the only survivor. SCP-973 killed the other nine agents and fled the scene. While it is believed that the Foundation team was able to wound the anomalous creature, it was neither contained nor incapacitated in any real sense and the next report of a 973 incident occurred just nine days later. SCP-973's ability to seemingly appear at a new location and the difficulty it has shown in being contained has gotten it a well-earned Euclid classification. 
the roughly 60 kilometers of highway on which it is known to appear is under satellite surveillance at all times, and all traffic between 10 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. is diverted along a non-highway detour route, by force if necessary. Unfortunately for the SCP Foundation and the general highway-using populace, these security protocols have necessitated frequent updates. Because while the area that SCP-973 engages in its predatory behavior on is well known, both the time of day during which it will appear and the area it seems to affect are expanding. You're on your way home from work after having just finished working a double shift. It's late and the interstate is completely abandoned, no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20 minute drive, but you know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long straight road. The rattling causes a piece of tape to fall off of the gauge cluster revealing a lit, check engine light beneath. You grab the tape and put it back over the light, covering it once again. There, good as new. You turn on the radio, and it comes to life for just a moment before dying. You slap the radio and it blinks to life for just a second before dying again. You're about to slap it again when you notice lights in your rearview mirror. And more than just a pair of headlights, it's a whole wall of lights. They're getting closer, and quickly too. Before you know it, they look like they're barreling down on you. But then, they suddenly go black, blinking out of existence. Did that trucker just turn off his lights, you think? You have no time to dwell on the thought, because the sound of an explosion suddenly causes you to scream in fright. It sounds like lightning has struck just inches from your car. The inside of your car suddenly lights up with fire and smoke. Has your engine exploded? What's going on? No, it's not coming from you, it's coming from next to you. You don't know where it appeared from, but next to your car is now a massive semi. At least, you think it was a semi. The smoke is so thick it makes you cough and you quickly can't see. You lose control of the car and slam on the brakes, but you can feel yourself going off the road. As the smoke finally clears up inside of your car, you can see the moon. It's at this moment that you realize you're no longer right side up as the car flips and tumbles through the air. You open your eyes to find that you are still buckled into your seat. You release the seatbelt and drop to the roof of the car. You crawl out to find that your car slid to a stop upside down, several meters from the road. You look around, and far off in the distance, you can see it. The semi that ran you off the road, driving at an almost impossible rate of speed off into the night. You look back at your car, which is completely totaled, and wonder what you're going to do now. It's late the next morning when you finally get back home. The police did not seem to believe your story about the magically appearing semi-truck causing your single car accident, but they did at least give you a ride back home after administering a sobriety test. You enter your small studio apartment and look around at the sparsely decorated room, wondering how you're going to pay rent next month if you can't get to your job. You go to the fridge and open the door, but there's nothing inside except for a carton of milk that's well past its expiration date. You open it and take a whiff, but this is too far gone even for your state of desperation. You close the fridge and lean on the door, trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're so deep in thought that you barely notice the mail being pushed through the slot in your door. You decide to go pick it up, even though you know it will only be bad news. And you were right. Bills, bills, and more bills. First, second, and final notices. You wonder if you've ever had a piece of good news show up through that slot in your door. What's this, though? The last piece of mail is a battered and folded envelope that looks like it's been used and repurposed many times. It feels thick and heavy, but there's no information on it at all. It's completely blank. You open the envelope, and your eyes light up. Inside is money. It's a stack of crinkled old bills, different denominations, all in a random order, but there's a lot of them. There must be over a thousand dollars here. And there's something else, too. A note. You unfold the creased and dirty piece of paper to see a simple message that looks like it was hastily written in black crayon. All the note says is, sorry about last night, hope this helps, compadre. You flip the note over and look in the envelope again, but there's nothing else other than the wad of cash. The apology note may have been unsigned, but you weren't the first to receive something like it, and you would be far from the last. The SCP Foundation, though, knows exactly who sent it. This was a message from SCP-3899, also known as the Night Hauler. SCP-3899 is a black Peterbilt 379 semi-trailer truck with an attached trailer, but as you no doubt have determined, this is no ordinary truck. 
SCP-3899 has the anomalous effect of appearing seemingly at random upon stretches of highway within the continental United States, and usually at a considerable distance away from any other motorists. The truck will manifest already in motion, traveling within roughly 3 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit, but it will not stay at this speed. Once SCP-3899 has appeared, it will almost immediately begin accelerating, and the speeds it can reach are truly staggering. Despite appearing to be a normal truck, SCP-3899 is able to reach impossibly fast speeds, and it's been observed traveling at over 420 kilometers per hour, or 267 miles per hour. As SCP-3899 flies down the road, it will attempt to avoid other vehicles and roadside objects, and has even been shown the ability to displace itself across short distances, which it seems to mostly do in order to avoid collisions with vehicles. SCP-3899 will disappear and then immediately appear somewhere else, though always within 300 meters of its last location. This reappearance will be accompanied by a thick cloud of dense, black smoke that lab tests have revealed to consist of a mixture of diesel fuel combustion byproducts, volcanic ash, and trace amounts of unidentified human blood. The anomalous truck will only appear at night and will demanifest completely once it encounters direct sunlight or if it causes an automotive accident, which it has done plenty of times. In one particular incident, undercover SCP Foundation agents working within the Virginia State Department of Transportation became aware of reports of a large black truck appearing on a particular stretch of interstate that had caused multiple accidents. They were able to track down and locate one of the victims of these incidents, a woman named Martha Lewis, who they soon brought in for questioning under the guise of it being a police investigation. The agents questioned Martha on her experience, and she explained her own interaction with the black semi. She said, It's all still clear in my head. I'm driving down I-64 on my way home and the sun had just gone down. There's no other cars and I'm about to take my exit when out of nowhere this huge truck just appears right next to me. There was a bunch of smoke, like it was on fire or something, and the sound was like a bolt of lightning had just struck right next to me. It all happened so fast. All the smoke clouded my windshield, and before I could really process what was happening, I was plowing right through a concrete divider and into some trees. I think I passed out. When I came to, there were paramedics and cops. They took me to the hospital. The agents asked if anything happened after that, and she said there was one other odd thing. When she left the hospital and went home, there was a letter waiting for her, but it didn't have a return address. Inside was a large amount of US currency in a random assortment of denominations, with many of the bills appearing wrinkled and worn. There was a note in the envelope too, which read, I'm sorry, didn't mean no harm, for the damages, get y'all a new rig and drive on. Later foundation analysis of the document revealed that the note was written with a piece of charcoal on non-anomalous notebook paper. Now you're probably asking yourself the same question that the SCP researchers had. Just who is the driver of SCP-3899 that apparently wrote this odd note and also paid for the damages they caused? The operator of the truck, which has been designated as SCP-3899-1, is a very mysterious figure. Observers who have been able to get a brief glimpse inside of the truck as it moves past them at a rapid speed have described the driver as looking only like a silhouette of a slightly overweight male wearing the type of headwear that is typically referred to as a trucker hat. Some reports have also alluded to the presence of what appears to be smoky, tentacle-like appendages within the cab, though all further efforts to determine the exact physical characteristics of 3899-1 have failed, as the truck has proved resistant to any kind of outside scanning equipment. Most of what is known about the driver has come in the form of direct communication, though not in the form of interviews or any other sort of face-to-face -face interaction. No, while SCP-3899-1 has never been willing to stop and have a discussion with Foundation agents, it does seem more than willing to speak with anyone and everyone in its immediate vicinity over Citizens Band, or CB Radio, which is a type of shortwave person-to-person -person communication system that is popular with many long-haul truckers. In one particular instance, an SCP Foundation helicopter happened to be traveling above a stretch of road where SCP-3899 appeared. An agent within the helicopter began communicating with the anomalous trucker, first asking for their call sign, to which SCP-3899-1 replied, I'm a night hauler and I'm coming in hot. I know y'all can feel this speed. After adjusting their volume to compensate for 3899-1's loud response, the agent asked if the entity could explain where they came from. 3899-1 answered with, I roll with the wind. My wheels sing sweet love to the blacktop. 
I'm filling y'all's veins with road salt and exhaust and the smell of burning rubber. Ain't no bother where I'm from. We all gotta live for the ride and die for nothing. I see, the agent responded before asking, are you hauling anything in particular? SCP-3899-1 came back with, Ain't you listening, girl? You seeing this? What I got is pure rattling salvation. 18 wheels at a time. When y'all's roads is choked, when the ways is blocked and y'all's speed is all dead and gone. I'm dropping this load and we'll all be drinking gas and breathing smoke. The agent didn't understand, though, and asked again who they were and what they wanted. 3899-1 replied, This is for the souls of the road, for the long nights and dead engines, and everyone trying to put that horizon under their wheels. I am the roar of hot iron. I am screaming freedom. I am the death of all barriers. This rig ain't got no quit, honey. I do not stop. Can you feel the rumble? Can you see the fire and smell the burn? I know you can. I can taste your heart and I know you want to fly apart with me. When the agent began to answer in the affirmative that they could indeed, quote, feel the rumble, seemingly caught up in the excitement of SCP-3899-1's proclamation, the investigation was quickly halted and the helicopter broke off from its pursuit. Following this incident, the potential mimetic influence of communicating with 3899-1 is under investigation. SCP-3899, being currently uncontainable by any conventional means, has been classified as Keter. Upon reports of it manifesting, all CB radio transmissions emanating from the truck are monitored by nearby Foundation listening posts for attempted contact by SCP-3899 to civilian recipients. Any individuals who are contacted are to be administered Class B amnestics, as are any eyewitnesses of the truck itself. All information about SCP-3899 is to be suppressed, and a disinformation campaign is active to make all reports of a mysterious truck that can appear out of nowhere and move at impossible speeds seem like nothing more than an urban legend. Just what is SCP-3899? Is the driver some sort of anomalous ghost, or perhaps an old, eldritch god, a manifestation of freedom and perpetual motion given physical form as a diesel-powered behemoth on the highway? Perhaps the answer to that question is up to you. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing, where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought. Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates, when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen. A massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now, treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes 
that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file. SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. In 1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea, the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. 
SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation, and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought battleship from the U.S. Navy, the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. Thirty hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. And it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end-of-the-world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A, and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened, though and the pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now-surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight, and should 2846-B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846-A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. It's late at night and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. 
They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night, and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees. You can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere, right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident, and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see is a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body, just a few scraps of clothing, and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack, a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature by far is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin there are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull, and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin, which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns, it is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway, and will begin to chase or run straight towards them giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, they will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear, or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. 
Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered, as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No lairs, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site 17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. The girl sighs and slumps in her seat kicking at the back of the bucket seat in front of her. Her mother, sitting in the car's front passenger side seat, doesn't even notice. She's too busy taking photographs out the window and chattering with her husband who's driving the car. That's all they've been doing all day, and the girl is sick to death of it. Her parents dragged her on this stupid vacation trip, and now she's got to waste her whole summer away from her friends. She stares out the window and watches the pastoral countryside slide past. The quaint little villages and rolling hillsides really excite her parents, but she could not care less. Mom and Dad planned this family vacation across Europe for months, but she would much rather have gone someplace interesting instead. There are only so many boring old castles and stupid cathedrals that you can look at before you just lose your mind. The girl sighs and crosses her arms across her chest in silent resignation. Guess we're just gonna look at more dumb buildings, she mutters. Honey, can you stop that? Your father worked really hard to put this trip together, and the least you could do is pretend to have a good time," says her mother, momentarily lowering her camera to berate her ungrateful daughter. Huh? It's the first time that her mother has acknowledged her all day. I think you're really gonna like today's itinerary, says her father, grinning as if he's got a delicious secret that he can't wait to share. We know it's been hard for you spending your whole summer away from home, so today we're gonna do something just for you. Uh-huh, says the girl. Sure, Dad. She rolls her eyes and pulls out a cell phone. At least she can still get internet access out here. Desperate for something to distract her from the monotony of this car trip, she quickly scrolls through her feed and reads all the notes that her friends back home are posting. She frowns. Her classmates are all posting about the latest blockbuster film in the girl's favorite media franchise, Vampire Boyfriend. She grits her teeth. She likes to consider herself a Vampire Boyfriend superfan. She's a well-known poster in the Vampire Boyfriend online community, famous for her fanfiction as well as her own original character, Vampire Girlfriend. In fact, her writing is somewhat controversial. A lot of Vampire Boyfriend purists have accused her character Vampire Girlfriend of being a Mary Sue, and they object to her stories where a Vampire Boyfriend meets and falls madly in love with her, to the point that he forgets his canon lover from the film series, Vampire Wife. She's annoyed to see that her friends got to see the new Vampire Boyfriend movie on opening night, while she's stuck out here on this stupid family vacation. The movie won't premiere in Europe for another few months, and there's no way she's going to be able to avoid spoilers for that long. Everything about this situation seems tailor-made to irritate her. 
and the excited giggles of her parents in the front of the car as they exchange knowing glances are only annoying her more. Trust me, you're gonna love this, says her father again. He peers at an unfolded roadmap in his lap, mutters something under his breath, and turns the car off the main highway and onto a narrow gravel road. The girl grits her teeth as the car rattles over the uneven ground so hard that it nearly jostles her cell phone from her grasp. She tries to distract herself by typing some notes to herself, plot points for the latest vampire boyfriend fanfiction that she's working on. In her new story, Vampire Girlfriend is going to be kidnapped by werewolves, leading Vampire Boyfriend to have an existential crisis as he struggles to find meaning in a world without his beloved. She makes a note that Vampire Girlfriend should look, dress, and talk just like her. After all, she imagines, wouldn't she be the perfect match for Vampire Boyfriend? She pauses, a momentary, dreamy expression on her face, as she imagines how much better a weekend together with Vampire Boyfriend would be compared to this boring car trip. This can't be right, mumbles her father, scanning the horizon. But the directions said. Suddenly he brightens up. Oh, there it is. Playland. The girl cranes her neck to see that the car is fast approaching what appears to be a little carnival at the end of the road. She rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Of course, her parents would take her here. First, they bore her with endless visits to museums and historical sites, and now, when they want to make it all up to her, they take her to a carnival for babies. She's not a kid anymore, but her parents still think that this sort of goofy nonsense should excite her. I know you've been bored going to all the historical sites with us, Honey Pumpkin, says her father as he pulls the car into a parking spot and applies the brake. That's why I asked the hotel concierge if there was anything good around here for kids. And wouldn't you know it, the next morning, what did I find shoved under our door? Three free tickets. He holds up the tickets as if they were a trophy he'd won. The girl's mother nods approvingly. Now that's good service, I hope you left him a big tip. The girl groans. You can't be serious, Dad. A carnival? What, do you expect me to ride on the teacups or something? I'm 15, I'm not a dumb baby anymore. Language, young lady, admonishes her mother as she unbuckles her seatbelt. Your father worked really hard to find this place just for you. The least you could do is show a little gratitude for once. Oh, you think you're too old now, says her father. But I bet once we see some of these rides, boy, I'll bet you feel just like a kid again. He inhales deeply. Even inside the car, the unmistakable fair smells of funnel cake and corn dogs are in the air. You smell that? It smells like fun. Sure, fun. The girl pockets her cell phone. The family exits the car and walks toward the Playland gate, where they're greeted by a costumed employee. Welcome to Playland, announces the employee in a chipper voice. Your favorite amusement park. When you're at Playland, you'll find that the worries of the day melt away, and it's time for play. Oh, you speak English, says the father. He turns to the mother. See, now that's service. He hands over the complimentary tickets. The employee takes them with a smile and a flourish, and then ushers the family through the gate. The girl, however, can't stop staring at the gatekeeper. If she didn't know any better, she would think that he was dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. But that doesn't make any sense. It must just be a coincidence. But once they enter the park, she sees that all the employees are dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. The guy standing behind the counter of the ring toss booth, the guy manning the balloon station. The uniform for this park looks like the outfit that she imagined Vampire Boyfriend would be wearing in her first fanfiction story. Wait, says the girl, staring up at the bundle of helium balloons floating above the balloon vendor. Each balloon bears the name Vampire Boyfriend and the fanged bat logo of the film series. So it's not a coincidence at all? This theme park really is themed after her favorite films? Her father notices her change of expression, and he nudges her in the ribs. Eh? Eh? I told you that you like it. This is all about those movies you like so much, huh? Ghost Boyfriend or whatever? It's Vampire Boyfriend, Dad, she says distantly, but she's too mesmerized by her surroundings to put much feeling into the barb. How much for a balloon? asks her father, pulling open his wallet and quickly thumbing through a stack of local currency. Oh, no charge, says the balloon vendor brightly. He plucks a string from the bundle and hands it over. Everything's free for our valued special ticket holders. Well, would you listen to that, says her father. He replaces his wallet in his back pocket. Now, this is the kind of carnival that I wish we had back in the States. The girl awkwardly takes the proffered balloon. She feels silly holding it, but she's more confused about why it's free. The whole point of offering free entry into a carnival is to gouge people with overpriced rides and souvenirs, right? But everywhere she looks, she can't help but notice signs advertising free corn dogs and bumper cars, unlimited rides for zero dollars. How can this carnival make enough money to keep operating if it's not charging for anything? In fact, how can this carnival make enough money to keep operating when it's based around a niche film like Vampire Boyfriend? Are there really that many Vampire Boyfriend fans out here to keep this place in business? Not that there's anyone else around. 
As she scans her surroundings, she realizes that, while there are plenty of costume employees bustling around the fair, she doesn't see any other fair goers. It's as if this whole carnival was created and maintained solely for her benefit. Hey, Pumpkin, how about a ride? I bet you'd love to try out some bumper cars, huh? Says her father. How about we go for a race and you can see if you can beat your old man, huh? He points to a bumper car ride across the midway. The girl stares. Like all the other rides, it's covered in vampire boyfriend murals. This one depicts a young woman running away from a pack of werewolves, and the young woman looks exactly like the girl. It couldn't be. But there's no other explanation. The young woman in the mural matches exactly the description of the girl's character vampire girlfriend from her fanfiction story, and the image of the werewolves looks like it's an illustration of the scene where vampire girlfriend gets kidnapped. How could this be? Could it be that the artist, obviously a fan of the vampire boyfriend films, is also familiar with her fanfiction? But even if that was the case, it's absurd to think that he would use it as an inspiration for a theme park ride. Who other than her would possibly recognize this scene? Hmm, says the girl's mother, walking up behind her and peering at the mural. Why, that girl looks just like you. I know, she does, says the girl quickly. It's almost a relief to know that her mother has also noticed the resemblance. At least it means that she's not imagining things. At the same time, she feels a twinge of guilt. Readers online are always accusing her of using Vampire Girlfriend as a thinly disguised self-insert. Seeing this larger-than-life picture of Vampire Girlfriend makes her think that there might be some merit to the accusation. Come on, you lot, stop worrying about some old picture and let's have some fun, says her father. He offers money to the ticket taker parked behind the kiosk, but the man merely shakes his head. Your money is no good here, sir, says the ticket taker. The bumper cars are free for our favored guests today. Their father clambers into the rink and ambles toward a bumper car. Her mother tugs at the girl's arm as if to encourage her to join in, but the girl resists. Come on, what's gotten into you? says her mother. This place is just weird, says the girl. Like, half of the stuff here isn't even from the official vampire boyfriend lore. It's all stuff that I made up for my stories. Her mother rolls her eyes in annoyance. Really, we go to all this trouble to find something that you would like to do, and all you want to do is complain? I'm sorry, ma'am, is there some problem here? The family is startled as another employee walks up to them. He's also dressed like vampire boyfriend, and a wide smile is plastered across his face. You folks look like you're upset about something. You're damn right I'm upset about something, yells the girl. In her rage, she throws her drink at the employee. He barely reacts as the cup explodes against his chest, dousing him with sticky soda. What's going on here? Where did you hear about Vampire Girlfriend? Ma'am, Playland is designed to give every visitor the perfect experience, says the employee blandly. That's not good enough. Tell me what's going on here. The employee's attitude changes on a dime. His bright smile fades, and suddenly his tone turns stern. Ma'am, I'm afraid that you're going to ruin everyone's fun if you keep up this sort of behavior. We like to keep things fun here at Playland. If you want to spoil the fun, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Fine, then we'll leave. Oh, come on, young lady, we just got here, snaps her mother. We literally drove all day to get here and you want to leave after just one ride? You don't even like rides. There's a principle involved here, says her father sternly as he saunters up. Young lady, if that's your attitude, then I think maybe you should go wait in the car, because your mother and I intend to have a good time. The girl doesn't have a chance to argue. The employee rests his hands heavily on her shoulders and turns her around. Don't worry, folks. We'll escort her back to your car. You can join her as well when you're ready. The girl cannot believe what's happening. The employee politely but firmly steers her toward the exit, and Frog marches her out the gate. He abandons her in the parking lot, tipping his hat and smiling brightly before he disappears back inside the park. Please try to enjoy yourself, ma'am, until your parents are ready to join you. In the meantime, why don't you work on that new fanfiction you've been planning? How do you know about that? yells the girl. The employee doesn't answer, simply turning and fading back into the crowd. She rushes to the gate, but the gatekeeper stops her. Sorry, ma'am, no re-entry without a ticket. But I have a ticket, she cries. You saw it, my dad gave it to you like half an hour ago. Come on, you can't be serious. She tries to push past him, but the gatekeeper grabs her wrists with surprising strength and holds her. Still smiling, he firmly escorts her back out to her car before releasing her. Please, ma'am, don't make a scene. You're going to disturb our guests. Who's in charge here? I, I need to talk to the manager. I want my parents back right now. The gatekeeper doesn't even respond. He simply returns to his station. There's nothing that the girl can do now but wait. She sits down in the gravel and leans her back against the side of the car. Minutes turn to hours, and still her parents haven't returned. Eventually, she goes back to yell at the gatekeeper again. Where are my parents? They should have been back hours ago. 
Sorry, ma'am. I guess your parents are just having too much fun right now. I'm sure you'll see them again soon, though, says the gatekeeper. The girl shivers as she feels a bite in the cool twilight air. She notices that the sun is starting to dip behind the mountains. It'll be dark soon. How much longer could they take? Even if they decided to ride on every ride in the park, surely they would be done by now. What time does the park close? Asks the girl, a note of panic rising in her voice. The gatekeeper blinks serenely. Playland is open 24-7, ma'am. We're always here when you want to play. The girl feels the color drain from her face as she ponders the possibilities. Her father has the car keys, so she can't take the car to go for help. She pulls out her cell phone, but she doesn't know the number she would need to alert any local authorities. And it's not like she speaks the language anyway. Other than the employees here at Playland, she hasn't met a single person in this whole trip who speaks English. She's completely helpless, trapped, and there's nothing that she can do except wait and hope. As the night settles in, she realizes that her wait might have just started. <laughs> it might not be the happiest place on Earth, but it definitely tries to be. And while the world is full of sketchy amusement parks, most of them just want your money. The amusement park known as SCP-1357, however, genuinely wants you to have a good time. Sometimes it wants you to have a good time, whether you want to or not. SCP-1357 is a theme park with an area of approximately 4 square kilometers, located somewhere in Poland. The park has four entrances, at each of the cardinal directions. SCP-1357 is highly selective about who it allows to enter the park, restricting access to parties that meet the following criteria. The group must contain at least two adults in a romantic relationship. It must contain at least one member who is under the age of 18 and who thinks of the aforementioned romantic couple as their guardians. And every member of the party must possess a free ticket, hereafter referred to as SCP-1357-B. The park does not charge for admission, and the only way to gain access is to have possession of an instance of SCP-1357-B. Once inside, SCP-1357 looks like any other carnival, with thrill rides, amusement arcades, midway games, and concession booths. Highly unusual for a carnival, though, is that SCP-1357 does not accept any money. All rides, food, and souvenirs are free. The layout and theme of the park are different for different visitors and appear to be highly contingent on the desires of the youngest member of any visiting party. Often, the park will appear themed after various popular media properties, such as Batman, Winnie the Pooh, or Barney the Dinosaur. However, visiting parties accompanied by more imaginative kids may encounter substantially weirder things in the park, including talking animals, sentient foodstuffs, temporal displacements, and even extra-dimensional portals. Although the park normally sits empty, when a group meeting entry requirements arrive at the gate, SCP-1357 will spontaneously manifest a full working staff, people designated as SCP-1357-A. Instances of SCP-1357-A appear to be ordinary humans of various ages, ethnicities, sexes, and genders, all clothed in matching uniforms, suggesting that they are employees of the park. Instances of SCP-1357-A are exceptionally friendly and helpful, and are extremely dedicated to making sure that visitors to SCP-1357 have a good time. In fact, there's nothing that they care about more. There is, however, a darker side to SCP-1357, and one incident suggests the frightening lengths to which the park will go to make sure that its younger visitors truly enjoy their stay. As part of an experiment, a Foundation agent visited the park with his own family, each member equipped with audio recording devices that continuously transmitted to Foundation consoles. During his stay, he attempted to interrogate an instance of SCP-1357-A. The instance of SCP-1357-A refused to answer the agent's questions about the purpose or origin of the park, instead lamenting that the agent's attitude was going to spoil the fun for his family. Eventually, instances of SCP-1357-A escorted the agent to an exit and forcibly removed him from the park. When his wife attempted to follow him, the couple's daughter refused to leave. Instances of SCP-1357-A separated the daughter from her family, removing the wife from the park and keeping the daughter inside, leaving the parents with only vague assurances that their daughter would be returned when she was ready to leave the park. Attempts to forcibly recover the daughter proved futile, and even a well-armed rescue team was unable to overcome the seemingly infinite numbers of SCP-1357-A that SCP-1357 manifested to protect itself. Hopes that SCP-1357 might indeed allow the daughter to leave when she became bored with the park attractions also proved to be futile. Audio captured from the daughter's recording device seems to indicate that when she eventually demanded that SCP-1357-A's release her, 
She was instead placed into some sort of machine that altered or brainwashed her into becoming an SCP-1357-A herself. Subsequent park visits by Foundation researchers have revealed a new SCP-1357-A that matches the daughter's physical description but does not display any memories of her past life. Interactions with the SCP-1357-A that resembles the missing daughter reveal that, like other instances of SCP-1357-A, her only thoughts are on how to please park visitors and help them enjoy a pleasant visiting experience. In the end, Playland may offer the ultimate amusement park experience for free, but it might still exact a price that's way too high. Watch this, the teenage boy says before jumping his skateboard up onto the stair railing. His friends watch in amazement as he deftly guides his board down the long rail. They hoot and holler in support until suddenly the boy seems to lose his balance. He falls from the rail and tumbles down the stairs of the large parking garage where they had been practicing their skateboarding tricks. The boy hits the ground at the end of the stairs and all of his friends go quiet. The boy is stunned, but eventually he opens his eyes and stands up, but none of his friends can do anything except stare. Oh no, oh no, oh no. The boy says as he looks down at his arm, which is now bent at a 90 degree angle in a spot where no joint should exist. The children watching all begin to scream, and one, unsure of what else to do, turns and runs. What do I do? What do I do? The boy with the broken arm says to no one and everyone. Luckily, one of the group quickly collects herself and steps forward to take control of the situation. Come on, she says, we're getting you to the hospital. The girl puts her arm around him on his non-damaged side and helps him to the street where they have a stroke of good luck. Parked just a block away is an ambulance. Hey, the girl cries out, waving towards the ambulance. The paramedics inside must have seen her because the ambulance's lights immediately come on and it drives the short distance to them. The ambulance stops and two paramedics quickly exit the vehicle. The paramedics don't even need to ask what happened. They can obviously see from the unnatural angle of the boy's arm that he needs immediate medical attention and they quickly place him into the back of the ambulance. The girl begins to pull herself into the back as well, but is quite forcefully shoved back into the street. Patience only is the sole response from the paramedic who pushed her before he slams the door shut. The girl gets a brief look at her friend's frightened face through the back window as the ambulance speeds away. Several days later, the children are sitting outside of the same parking structure, but none of them are in any mood to skate. All they can think about is their missing friend. Neither the boy's parents nor the police have any idea what happened to him or where he went. There's no records at any of the local hospitals of him ever being brought there, nor does there seem to be any evidence of this particular ambulance having existed at all. No one even seems to believe the children that he got into an ambulance. The whole story just seems too far-fetched and outlandish, but the children know what they saw. As they discuss the events for the hundredth or perhaps thousandth time, one of the smallest of the group suddenly stands up and points. There it is! The rest of the group looks in the direction he's motioning and sees the same thing. It's the ambulance. None of them know what to do as the vehicle flies past them, this time with no lights on, and comes to a stop a block away from where they first spotted it. They watch as the two paramedics exit the vehicle and go around to the back. It's hard to see from this distance, but it looks as though they took something out of the rear of the ambulance, something that requires both of them to lift before dropping it on the sidewalk behind some trash cans. The children watch as the paramedics get back into the ambulance and drive away, disappearing just as quickly as they appeared. After a moment of shock, they all in unison begin running to the place where the ambulance stopped. They come to a skidding halt just in front of the trash cans. None of them can do anything except stare until they all break out into screams, one of the children turning and immediately running away. And they have good reason to scream, because in front of them is their friend. His arm is no longer broken, appearing to have been somehow repaired in just a matter of days, but it is also no longer attached to his shoulder. The boy opens his eyes as his friends scream and looks down to see that his arms and legs have been reattached at a new angle, jutting out from his back, leaving him standing on all fours, his face staring up at the sky like some kind of twisted animal. What happened to this young man was tragic, but he wasn't the first victim of this strange malicious anomaly, and unfortunately, neither would he be the last, because this was SCP-4419, also known as the Butcher's Chariot. SCP-4419 appears to be a seemingly normal vehicle which resembles a standard ambulance, though the exact make and model varies between manifestations. This anomalous ambulance will appear spontaneously in locations where a medical emergency of some kind is about to take place. 
Just how SCP-4419 is able to predict where and when these events will take place is unknown, nor is it understood how it always takes the form of an ambulance that resembles one appropriate to the local area. Once the medical event has occurred, whether that be a minor injury like a sprain or something more serious, such as a gunshot wound, SCP-4419 will quickly approach the injured individual. Two individuals which have a humanoid appearance and are dressed in paramedic uniforms that are, just like the ambulance, always appropriate to the location, will exit the ambulance. They will then secure the victim, using a stretcher if need be, and place them in the back of the ambulance. While the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419 will, for the most part, act as though they are normal medical professionals, they will strongly resist any attempt to either impede them in their quest to secure the injured person, as well as prevent anyone else except for their target from getting into the back of the SCP-4419 ambulance, up to and including the use of extreme physical force. As soon as the paramedic appearing individuals have managed to secure the victim in the back of the ambulance, it will then quickly leave the area at a high rate of speed, and research has shown that as soon as it is out of observation, SCP-4419 will demanifest along with whoever is inside. But this isn't the end of what this anomaly has in store for its victim. Between two and seven days later, the SCP-4419 ambulance will suddenly reappear at the same area where it picked up its victim. The same individuals will exit the ambulance and leave the victim somewhere nearby before getting back in the vehicle and leaving the scene once again. The victim who is left behind will always have suffered what can only be described as invasive bodily modifications. Their injuries are so extreme that in most cases they should have resulted in the death of the victim, and yet they will always somehow still be alive. While the exact form of modification will vary from victim to victim, there does appear to be some correlation between the original medical emergency and the resulting procedure. And the SCP Foundation has documented a number of encounters with SCP-4419 stretching all the way back to the early 1980s. Some notable examples include one from 1983, in which a pedestrian who was crossing the street was struck by an automobile, resulting in them breaking their leg. SCP-4419 was on site and quickly helped the man into the back of the ambulance. When he was returned several days later, all of his limbs had been reattached in such a way that they were protruding from the front of his torso. In another event which occurred in 1994, a man suffered a broken jaw in a fight outside of a bar. To no surprise, SCP-4419 was on hand and took the man away for treatment. When he was next seen, his jaw had been permanently forced open and a glass window had been installed in the back of his throat which permitted direct viewing of his heart which had also been moved to the back of the throat. Unfortunately, there was no way to reverse this procedure, and the man had to be euthanized. In 2003, a husband and wife were in a car accident where they each sustained multiple broken bones. When SCP-4419 dropped them back off, the two had been fused together at the back, and any bones that were broken in the crash had been removed completely. When an elderly gentleman had a heart attack in 2006, he was picked up by SCP-4419 and returned with 11 new, non-functioning hearts grafted inside of his body. Attempts were made to remove these additional hearts through surgery, but unfortunately, the man did not survive the procedure. In 2008, a structure fire resulted in 19 people suffering extreme burns. Seven more injuries came when a crowd attempted to stop the SCP-4419 paramedics from placing all of the victims in the back of the ambulance, but they were unsuccessful in preventing them from leaving the scene with them. When the group of victims was finally returned, it was as a single organism, a large solitary mass which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. No method for euthanizing this organism has been able to be found, and currently they are stored inside of a tank at Site-31. In perhaps the strangest sighting of SCP-4419, a US private was wounded while on patrol in Afghanistan, and a military medical evacuation vehicle arrived to evacuate him. Suspicious about the vehicle's sudden appearance and the forceful conduct of the medical staff, the private's fellow soldiers ended up opening fire on the vehicle. They reported seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the vehicle's surface, but they were unable to stop it from taking the injured private. In a deviation from its normal behavior, the victim was not returned to the same place, and instead appeared in the barracks the next day. The victim had been broken down into a thin paste and was spread across the walls. Agents were dispatched to secure what was left of the man, and they reported finding a still intact eyeball that dilated when they approached. The collected viscera has been labeled as remains and placed in storage, but it is currently unknown whether or not the victim has truly expired. 
due to the danger SCP-4419 presents to anyone who suffers an injury, as well as its ability to appear virtually anywhere on the planet, it has been classified as Keter. Containment efforts at this point are largely focused on maintaining information control and post-manifestation cleanup, as opposed to any attempts at physical confinement. Anyone who witnesses an SCP-4419 manifestation is to be administered amnestics, and victims are to be treated in order to restore them to their original physical state as much as possible, or euthanized when no viable medical treatments are available, with a cover story constructed in order to explain their death. SCP-4419 is one of the most cruel and sadistic anomalies in the SCP Foundation's database, ranking right up there with SCP-106, The Old Man. Hopefully one day we will find a means to contain this brutal so-called medical vehicle, but until then, be careful if you suffer an injury and an ambulance is suddenly on hand, you might come back changed in ways you never thought possible. It's late on a Saturday night in New York City, 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second-guess his decision. The platform is empty. And come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave, but just as he does, he hears a train. Good. Everything is normal. He checks his watch. 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop, and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home so he steps on board. Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange. But he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop! Stop! The man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052 also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition, just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning, to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. 
The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream. Per Order 69-A1 from 05 Council Member 05-9. There are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site 21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations, and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, Several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31st, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6th. This agent too was never recovered, though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13th. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27th, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send no more, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past, or the future, was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding, and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. Warning lights flash and heavy boots stomp down the sanitized hallways of Site-19. A mobile task force has been dispatched, wielding heavy weaponry and wearing tactical gear. But underneath their jet-black armor, 
These mobile task operatives are sweating. The SCP thereafter has a very particular set of skills, skills that make them a nightmare to people like this team. Plainly put, anything that the mobile task force can do, the anomaly can do better. Because the anomaly that chose to breach containment is SCP-056, codenamed A Beautiful Person. This shape-shifting being takes the form of a superior version of whatever object or entity it encounters, though typically only by a relatively slim margin. The Foundation has no real way of truly containing SCP-056 because of the unique nature of its anomalous abilities. Instead, their tactic has long been playing to the truly toxic ego of the creature, designing the containment chamber more like a luxury hotel room, perfectly suited to 056's refined taste. However, as a sentient being with a mean streak, keeping an entity like 056 permanently caged is rarely as simple as sprucing up said cage. Some days, like today, 056 will want a change of scenery, and on those days, there's almost nothing the Foundation can do to stop it. As the mobile task forces dispatched to Site-19 scan the halls and spool through security footage, desperately hoping to find some clue as to the vain creature's presence, 056 is actually long gone. Having assumed the form of a handsome, charming scientist after an average-looking scientist with bad social skills walked past its containment chamber, 056 had slipped out of the site undetected before anyone even realized that a breach had occurred. Then, seeing a vulture fly overhead, 056 had taken the form of a bald eagle and flown further, leaving the isolated Site-19 in the dust. 056 is ready and eager for a night on the town, but when 056 decides it's going to paint the town red, it doesn't always mean it in the metaphorical sense. 056 arrives in a small American town, like many that pop up along lonely desert highways. Noticing a plain, unremarkable woman walking past, it immediately transforms into an absolute stunner with fine diamond jewelry and an expensive-looking red dress. As she walks to a local diner, she turns heads from everyone she passes, doing nothing to hide her conceited smirk. I really should do this more often, she thinks. When she passes a self-conscious-looking woman with a fake Gucci handbag, 056 suddenly manifests the real deal, brimming with stacks of cash and even more jewelry. Everywhere she goes, her mere presence makes people feel terrible about themselves, and she couldn't be happier. She walks into a local diner, where a report on the radio is detailing abandoned, wrecked cars found along the side of a local highway. There were bodies inside in horrific states, so horrific that they couldn't even share the details on the broadcast. But 056 doesn't care about any of that. She simply orders some pancakes in the diner and rudely asks the cashier if he can break a $100 bill. When she receives her pancakes, she takes a single bite before throwing them at the wall and complaining about how terrible they are, then leaving. She takes joy in knowing how awful this will make people feel. On the way out, she decides to take a shortcut down a dark alley, where a woman in expensive clothes, carrying an expensive purse brimming with money, is liable to attract the wrong kind of attention. Two muggers, one armed with a switchblade and the other armed with a gun, emerge from the darkness, wearing malicious grins. That purse looks a little heavy there, lady, one of the muggers says. Yeah, how about you let us carry it for you, the other adds. 056 smiles and says, Are you sure you have the upper body strength? They don't take kindly to this. As the two muggers prepare to beat this strange woman within an inch of her life and steal all her earthly belongings, she suddenly transforms, shapeshifting into a ripped kung fu master in white robes. Before either of the muggers can respond to this baffling transformation, 056, in his kung fu master form, is beating the living hell out of them and leaving the dastardly duo in a crumpled heap on the ground as he walks away, whistling a merry tune. But making women feel inadequate, insulting small businesses, and beating up petty criminals isn't enough for SCP-056. This thoroughly unpleasant anomaly has the need for speed, and the best way to achieve that need is to obtain a car, or perhaps, even better, become one. Not long after the thought passes his mind, 056 arrives at a parking lot, he looks over the various parked cars, most of which are unremarkable specimens. That is, until he comes across a parked Ferrari and feels his imagination begin to soar with possibilities. A Ferrari? Oh, I can do better than that. In the following moments, SCP-056 flawlessly shapeshifts into a brand new, cherry red Bugatti sports car and starts doing gleeful donuts in the parking lot. 056 then puts the pedal to the metal and speeds out onto the road, where it can pick up some real speed having no idea that for once, it would attract some attention it didn't want. 
But 056 doesn't care about that yet. It's too focused on breaking its speedometer with sheer insane speed, tearing down the highway at over 100 miles an hour, then building and building and building. 056 is lucky that there are seemingly no other cars on the road tonight. Well, except one that it notices far in the distance behind itself. Is that a beat up old police cruiser? How embarrassing. 056 speeds up even more, hoping to leave the police cruiser as little more than a distant memory. But it doesn't work out that way. Instead, the beat up police cruiser miles behind 056's sleek supercar begins to build in speed. Little by little, it seems to be doing the impossible, catching up. Being a thoroughly arrogant and unpleasant anomaly, 056 doesn't take the prospect of being humiliated lightly. It decides to take a sharp left turn off of the highway onto a mostly dirty side road, slowing down slightly, as though to challenge the police cruiser to carry on the chase. The police cruiser accepts the challenge and makes the turn after 056 with shocking speed. How is this busted up old police cruiser keeping pace with a brand new anomalous Bugatti? 056 doesn't understand, but it won't give in. It has to keep believing it's the best, no matter what. 056 tears off down the road until it reaches some dense woods with only a single dirt road cutting through the middle. The Bugatti's wheels kick up mud and dry leaves, its roaring engine sending the animals of the forest scattering in every direction. And still, the police cruiser follows, its high beams cutting through the murky gloom of the forest. Suddenly, it goes from eerie silence, save for the roar of twin engines, to the flashes of red and blue lights and the shrill wail of the police cruiser's siren. 056 finds the whole arrangement laughable. It's escaped the SCP Foundation before. Did some small town cop really believe he could take 056 down? But what 056 doesn't know is that it isn't being followed by just any small town cop. It gets a clue to the true horrifying nature of its pursuer when the Bugatti's radio crackles into life and a single word begins endlessly repeating in a warped, scratchy voice suffused with static. Run, 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 run. 056 is at a loss. This doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be possible for any normal police cruiser to have this effect, unless. Before 056 can even finish the thought, the police cruiser closes the distance in a single freakish burst of speed. It smashes into the back of the Bugatti and rams it into a brutal tailspin, sending it skidding off the dirt road and crashing into the trees, where it flips twice and comes to rest upside down. Totaled. Its radio still repeats that single warped, ominous word. Run, run, run. Run! 056 is stunned as it lays, injured and in car form, against the cold and unyielding trees of this dark, isolated forest. How is that even possible? It doesn't make sense. Is this police cruiser some kind of undercover tactical vehicle in league with those worthless worms at the SCP Foundation? The police cruiser has ground to a halt on the dirt road, idling, its lights still cutting through the gloom. The driver's door, marked with the words, protect and serve, slides open, and a shadowy figure steps out. 056 can immediately sense an inhuman presence in its midst. This may look like some doughy, middle-aged cop with a handlebar mustache, but that's just a disguise. And if anyone understands disguises, it's SCP-056. What 056 doesn't know is that the entity about to attack it is, in fact, known to the SCP Foundation, but isn't aligned with them in the slightest. They refer to it as SCP-973, codenamed Smokey an anomalous police cruiser that contains a terrifying occupant. It's known as one of the more deadly, mysterious, and sadistic creatures that the Foundation still hasn't fully succeeded in containing. Any humans who fall prey to it have a terrifying demise in store for them, but how would an anomaly fare? We're about to find out. Smokey, the nightmarish anomalous police officer, begins walking down the grassy bank towards the overturned Bugatti. His skin is paper pale. His eyes glow a burning brimstone red. He clenches his pale, veiny fists, excited by the thought of the coming violence. This idiot in a sports car really thought it could get away from him? No one gets away from Smokey. Exit the vehicle, boy, Smokey says in a crackling southern drawl, or I'm gonna rip you out of it. But Smokey doesn't wait for an answer. He charges forward and digs his fingers into the metal of the car, displaying his terrifying superhuman strength. He begins tearing away parts of the car peeling back panels of metal like a normal person would peel an orange. He imagines the terror of the person within, the sweet fruit under all these layers of obstruction. Gonna get you, boy, 
he repeats, voice almost shaking with excitement. Gonna get you. Gonna get you. Gonna make you scream. Gonna make you scream like a scared little piggy. Then suddenly, the car just vanishes. The chunks of metal he's holding are gone. Smokey looks around, baffled. He's done strange and terrible things on these roads, but this is still a new one, even for him. He looks up and stares into the darkness of the forest. The car is nowhere to be seen out there. Where are you, boy? Smokey rasps. You think you can run from me? Smokey hears a subdued scoff coming from behind the tree in front of him, followed by a tall, dark stranger stepping out into the dim light of the cruiser's high beams. It's SCP-056, but it isn't taking the form of a luxury sports car anymore. Now, it's taking the form of a cinematic legend, Dirty Harry, as played by Clint Eastwood, the ultimate shoot-first-ask-questions-later cop. You think I'm running from you, punk? Harry asked. Truth is, I was sick of looking at that ugly mug of yours. Figured I'd take five, for I came back and put a bullet through it. Smokey growls, his jaw unhinging and extending into a horrific black hole. Not exactly disproving my point there, Slick, Harry chided. Smokey isn't one for trading barbs. He runs towards Harry with his hands extended, claws growing out of the tips of his fingers. But Harry knows he's dealing with a monster now, and he's ready to fight back. Quicker than Smokey can even notice, Harry reaches into a holster in his coat and pulls out his trademark weapon, a 44 Magnum revolver, one of the most powerful revolvers ever made, and he's a dead shot with it. Harry draws a bead on Smokey and fires a high-powered round through the monster's forehead. Smokey is staggered for a moment, seemingly almost stunned by the shot, but the effects wear off quickly. Smokey roars and swings for Harry, who dodges in the nick of time. Smokey's clawed hand tears through the bark of a nearby tree. 056 buries a moment of quiet anxiety. It thinks, even for me, this thing is powerful. I need to watch my step. You ought to show me some respect, boy. Smokey growls. I'm a man of the law. You have no idea what you're dealing with. He swings again and again for Harry, forcing him further back into the forest. 056 tries its best to maintain that unflappable Eastwood calm. Respect is earned, not given, punk. Harry says, leveling his magnum. You think you're hot stuff because you torture and terrorize? Putting down scum like you is exactly why I joined the force. Harry unleashes, emptying the cylinder into Smokey's center mass. Bang, 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 bang. Smokey's body does the bullet dance as Harry's magnum rounds punch into him like hypersonic metal fists. Smokey digs his feet into the ground and steadies himself. Harry reaches into his pocket for some spare rounds, discharges the empty shells from the cylinder, and begins quickly reloading the revolver. Smokey gives him no quarter. The demonic cop charges forward and grabs Harry by the lapels of his suit jacket, lifting him off the ground and slamming his back into a nearby tree. The revolver falls from his hand and clatters to the forest floor. Smokey has the upper hand now. His grip is ironclad. It seems as though 056, even as Dirty Harry, won't be able to escape this one. Smokey presses him against the tree until 056 can feel the bark creaking and his bones beginning to buckle. Not so talky now, aren't we, boy? Smokey snickers. I'm gonna kill you slow. You're gonna beg for mercy. You're a good fighter, 056 said, beginning to shift. But I'm better. Moments later, SCP-056 is no longer Dirty Harry. Now, he's John Wick. The movie super assassin specialized in almost every form of combat. Smokey is briefly confused, and 056 takes advantage of that. With a few expert strikes to Smokey's face, 056 is able to wriggle out of his grip and kick Smokey in the chest, creating some distance between them. Let's go. It's been too long since I've had a decent workout, 056, as John Wick says. Smokey reaches for John Wick, but John, drawing upon his years of combat experience, locks Smokey's attack and returns a brutal flurry of blows to Smokey's face and chest. Every time Smokey swings with his supernatural strength, 056 swipes at his arms and uses his momentum against him. While Smokey clearly has the strength advantage by the nature of SCP-056's anomalous ability, this form clearly trounces Smokey in terms of skill. Part of 056 is afraid, having rarely been met with this level of resistance. Another part of 056 is exhilarated. Getting to be better than an entity this formidable is a truly thrilling experience. You're really starting to get on my nerves, boy, Smokey says, pulling out a nightstick from his police belt. 056 draws a long titanium combat knife out of his coat. Prove it, he says, assuming a knife-fighting stance. 
Smokey swings for 056 with his nightstick, who blocks it with the edge of his blade. What follows is almost a kind of sword fight, where 056 and Smokey take turns striking and parrying with their respective weapons. 056 cracks his neck, giving a smarmy grin that only irritates Smokey further. The demonic cop throws his nightstick directly at 056's face. The arrogant anomaly is able to deflect the well-aimed stick with his knife, only to realize that it was just a distraction from the following haymaker. Smokey's fist collides with 056's cheek with the force of a runaway car. It knocks him off his feet, taking his legs out from under him and throwing him to the ground with a mighty thud. And Smokey doesn't let up. He crouches over the stunned 056 and strikes him again and again, pounding his clenched fists into 056's head. If the self-obsessed anomaly had any chance to speak, it probably would have yelled, Not the face! Not the face! Unlucky for 056, mercy is not a word in Smokey's vocabulary. 056 doesn't have time to transform. With every punch, 056's body is pounded deeper into the dirt. He can feel himself losing consciousness under the flurry of blows. For the first time, he's truly terrified about what will happen to him if he passes out. What terrible things will Smokey do to him? Suddenly, floodlights illuminate the forest from every angle. The hum of helicopters sound from far above. Tactical vehicles surround the forest, manned by highly trained, highly armed SCP Foundation mobile task forces. Snipers line up their shots on Smokey, preparing to fire with armor-piercing 50 caliber rounds. Ground troops armed with assault rifles all pour in. As though a magic spell has been cast, Smokey, along with his cursed cruiser, disappears. All that's left is a bruised, bloody, and disoriented SCP-056, still shaking in pain and terror on the ground. It doesn't take long for 056 to be surrounded by Foundation personnel, ready to take it back into containment. To even its own surprise, it's tremendously relieved. 056, whimpering, says, I'd like to go back to my room, please. The final bell rings, signaling the end of a new class's first day at middle school. A girl exits the building, her backpack slung over her shoulder, body hunched under its unfamiliar weight. It's been a long and tiring day. Her family just moved to this small Oklahoma town from the big city, and of course, she's spent every minute since then trying to adjust to her new surroundings. It's never easy to be the new kid in town. Right now, all she wants to do is to get home and relax. She doesn't want to think about school and its related anxieties for the rest of the night. As she walks down the stairs, she notices the school bus parked at the curb. Thank goodness, she thinks. I can't wait to get out of here. This day can't end soon enough. But for some reason, something about this bus sets her nerves on edge. What is it that just seems… off? There's nothing blatantly wrong with the bus, but when she looks closer, she realizes that it definitely looks a little strange. The different parts of the bus just don't add up. Some parts are new, clearly just off the factory floor, while others are battered and bruised from long-time wear. Some parts even seem to come from different makes and models of bus. I guess it's not that strange, she thinks. After all, her old school always had a measly budget. You could practically see the road through holes in the floor sometimes. Her new one probably just has those same issues. Aren't those problems all over the country, after all? The school probably just had to buy a dilapidated old bus cobbled together from random parts to make ends meet. And besides, she thinks as she watches her classmates pile onto the strange bus without a second thought, none of the other kids seem to think that there's anything weird going on. This must all just be in my head, she thinks. I'm probably just being weird because I'm so tired. I can't let myself become the new girl and the weird girl. The girl is startled as she hears a voice behind her. Hey! She turns and sees a boy that she recognizes. He sits behind her in class. They haven't spoken before now, but he seems friendly enough. You're the new kid in school, aren't you? He says. Yes, my family just moved to town. She tries to talk to him, but she can't help but keep getting distracted by the weird bus. Right, right. The boy glances at the bus, as if he can sense her discomfort with it. You worried about the bus? I was pretty nervous my first time riding it, but I don't worry about it anymore. You get used to it, he tells her. Uh, right, she says. The girl feels her cheeks going red with embarrassment. She doesn't want her classmate to think that she's scared of riding a bus. What if he tells the other kids that she's frightened of a bus ride? They're all going to think that she's some kind of silly baby. I'm not scared of the bus. It is just a bus, right? The boy grins, as if he knows something that she doesn't know. The girl doesn't want to admit her fear, and so with a defiant step, she climbs the stairs and enters the bus. Once she's on board, her unease doesn't go away. 
The first thing that she notices is that there is no one in the driver's seat. That's weird. Did the driver just step away to use the bathroom or something? Seems pretty irresponsible to leave the bus unattended. There's a line forming behind her, though, so she doesn't have time to think about this. She takes a seat and stares out the window, keeping to herself. The boy from her class follows and takes a seat next to her. It's a little wild at first, but trust me, you'll get used to it fast. In fact, some of us think it's kind of fun now. The girl blinks in confusion. Who is this weirdo that gets such a kick out of riding the bus? She almost wants to snap at him, to tell him that of course she's not scared of riding the bus. She's ridden the bus hundreds of times back at her old school. But at the same time, there's definitely something weird going on here. And as much as she's trying to play it cool, she's clearly not able to hide her feelings. This boy can easily sense that she's uncomfortable. Suddenly, the bus lurches into action and pulls away from the curb. But wait, how can this be? She never saw the driver get back on board. The bus can't be driving itself, can it? She stands up in her seat and cranes her neck to see. Her eyes bulge from her head in fear and surprise as she realizes that, in fact, there's no one driving the bus at all. The driver's seat is empty and the wheel is turning by itself as the bus careens down the road. Who's driving the bus? She shouts, but the other kids barely even react to her outburst. Most of them are chattering amongst themselves, and only one or two turn to look at her briefly before shrugging and turning back to their own private conversations. A chorus of giggles behind her alert her to the fact that she's just completely embarrassed herself. What's the matter, you scared? Calls an older boy from the back of the bus, guffawing loudly. Of course no one's driving. Don't you know anything? Leave her alone, says the boy in the seat next to her. It's her first time. She's never ridden the bus before. She's too panicked to correct him that, yes, she has been on the bus before, but not a bus like this one. What's going on? We're all gonna die! She cries, clutching at the seat in front of her in terror. Despite her fear, though, she can't help but notice that the bus isn't simply speeding into oblivion. The bus obeys all the traffic laws, stopping at stop signs and signaling before turns. It's almost as if the bus itself is alive and aware of what it's doing. That's just how it is says the boy next to her in a matter-of-fact voice as if he's anticipated her question. Apparently, this is a normal day for kids here in this Oklahoma town. The girl doesn't think she could ever get used to a bus that drives itself, but what comes next is going to prove to be even stranger. But you might want to close your eyes for this next part, says the boy. The girl asks him what he means by that, but before he can answer, she feels a strange wave of sudden nausea overcome her. Her vision goes hazy, and the whole world seems to waver in her sight. But the sensation passes quickly, and everything is quickly back to normal. Or is it? She turns to look out the window. The city passing by is familiar. She can recognize many of the same buildings that she passed on her way to school this morning. But now they seem strangely altered. The structures are in advanced states of disrepair, with broken windows and boarded up doors. The gutters are filled with trash and debris, and the streets seem to be abandoned. The bus takes a left turn down a side street, and the girl catches a brief glimpse of the town city hall in the distance. She gasps. City hall is on fire, great gouts of hot red flame pouring from the shattered windows. Sirens echo through the air. The sky above is an ominous red, filled with angry storm clouds with jagged bolts of dry lightning dancing between the thunderheads, and she can see the funnel of a distant tornado making a touchdown in the hills. The bus briefly comes to a stop in front of the library, dutifully obeying a flickering traffic light. The library's windows are dark, but she can vaguely see shapes moving about inside. Electric sparks shoot from malfunctioning street lamps and downed power cables flail like angry snakes in the street. It looks like some terrible natural disaster has hit the city, but what could it be? Surely she would have heard some warning while she was at school. It wouldn't have just carried on as usual in the classroom while the world outside burned. She turns to the boy next to her, a fearful question on her trembling lips. He seems to know what's going on. Otherwise, how could he be so eerily calm while everything outside the bus is falling apart or on fire? What happened to the city? Was there an earthquake? No, he would have felt it. Was there a hurricane? Every possible disaster scenario runs through her head as she desperately tries to think of an explanation. But what happens next reveals to her that there's no natural explanation for the strange sights that assail her eyes. As she watches through the window, a squadron of armed soldiers march down the street toward the darkened library. Suddenly the doors fly open and people pour out, screaming as if they're being chased by some unspeakable evil. The girl expects that the soldiers must be here for disaster relief, but she is horrified when, instead of helping the escaping library patrons, they instead open fire upon the crowd. The girl screams in terror, but the other kids barely even notice. They're too busy talking or laughing. 
One kid is so disinterested in the spectacle outside that he's playing with a handheld game console rather than watch the carnage unfold. How can this be happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? She's filled with terror as she wonders, is the whole town under siege? Is her house still standing? Are her parents safe? Where is this bus even taking her? I told you that you might want to cover your eyes, says the boy next to her. The bus continues on its route, passing all sorts of terrifying sights. A parking lot has been transformed into a mass grave. She watches as uniformed police line up peaceful citizens against a brick wall to brutally execute them by firing squad. Mass riots are taking place in the town's central park. People are yelling obscenities and pounding one another into pulp, while armed law enforcement officers sweep in to escalate the situation. The air is thick with screams, gunfire, and the smell of burning bodies. The shopping mall is overrun with giant spiders, which chase screaming shoppers out of the exits. She sees rats as big as cars scurrying out of the alleyways, grabbing random people with their taloned paws and biting their heads off with their long, sharp incisors. On the distant hills, she can also make out the outlines of even stranger creatures that she cannot identify. Dinosaurs, aliens, demons. She doesn't come from a particularly religious family, but the sights that she sees today definitely make her think that she might be seeing a glimpse into the maw of hell itself. The girl has never seen anything so awful in all her life. To her surprise, several of the other kids cheer as the bus drives past a gaggle of walking corpses. They're mutilated and half decomposed, but somehow still mobile, shambling down the sidewalk and moaning. How can the other kids be enjoying this? Yeah, 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 chant the kids. Zombies, that rules. Maybe we'll get to see them eat some brains for once, cries the older boy in the back of the bus with sudden glee. What is going on? repeats the girl. It's just the usual bus ride, says the boy next to her. Don't worry, I felt the same way when I first started at this school, but it's really not so bad. I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? The girl opens her mouth to respond, but she's suddenly overcome with that familiar feeling of nausea. The world quivers briefly in front of her, and suddenly, everything is back to normal. The sky is clear and blue, the buildings are no longer dilapidated, people are bustling in the streets, going about their usual business. There's no sign of any of the horrors that she just witnessed. No fires, no soldiers, no monsters, and no zombies. The boy next to her commented that they must have been reaching someone's stop. From around the bus, she hears several other kids groan in frustration. They were hoping that they would get to see some exciting zombie carnage, but it looks like that show will have to wait for another time. The bus slowly comes to a halt, and the girl tenses as she hears the hiss of its air brakes. The door opens, and the girl realizes that the bus has stopped in front of her house. She's relieved to see that her house is standing, and she can see her mother gardening in the front yard, safe and sound. Was it all a dream? This is my stop says the girl, standing up as if in a daze. Uh, the first time's always a little wild, says the boy as she leaves. Don't worry, tomorrow will be easier. The girl steps onto the curb and away from the bus. The doors close behind her, and the bus pulls away, continuing on its journey. Did you enjoy your first day of school today? asks the girl's mother. The girl can only stare in shock as the bus drives away. What just happened? Did a self-driving bus just take her on a tour of hell before bringing her right to her own doorstep? Or did she really just imagine that whole experience? As you astute Foundation veterans have probably already put together, this new girl at school didn't imagine anything she just saw. That girl just had her first encounter with SCP-3583. At face value, SCP-3583 resembles an ordinary school bus, albeit one composed of completely random parts all held together by some unknown force. The bus is self-driving, and in fact resists any attempt by a human to sit in the driver's seat. At some point, SCP-3583 became attached to a particular school in an undisclosed Oklahoma town for reasons the SCP Foundation still doesn't understand. Every school day, at 3.45 p.m., it appears outside of the school just as the school day comes to a close. The bus can hold up to 56 children and up to 8 adults. If it judges that not enough children have boarded, SCP-3583 will begin to honk its horn. The horn has a peculiar, hypnotic effect on all children within hearing range. They will be compelled to drop whatever they are doing and board the bus, meaning that the bus has some innate cognitohazardous properties. If the bus still feels that it hasn't reached its quota, it will increase the volume of its horn until it has attracted enough children that it can begin its route. Depending on how many adults have boarded, SCP-3583 has two distinct patterns of behavior. If four or fewer adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 1. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will dematerialize and enter a parallel reality called SCP-3583-A. 
SCP-3583-A superficially resembles the normal geography of the same Oklahoma town, with some minor but very important changes. The typical city landscape is replaced with a hellish alternative full of crumbling architecture, marauding monsters, shambling zombies, fires and natural disasters, and instances of military violence and civil unrest. SCP-3583 will travel through this terrifying hell dimension along normal bus routes, studiously obeying all traffic laws and pausing to re-enter our own reality, only to deliver kids to their own homes. Interestingly, SCP-3583 only offers door-to-door -door service and ignores all conventionally posted bus stops. If five or more adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 2. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will travel to the sites of mass casualty events, seemingly arriving in the days or weeks preceding the incident, where it will circle the area for approximately 45 to 100 minutes. After this, it will enter Pattern 1, delivering each child passenger to their home before then delivering its adult passengers home as well. Known mass casualty sites visited include Pompeii, Nanking, and the World Trade Center in New York. Passengers inside SCP-3583 can take photos or video through the bus window, and all footage shot from within SCP-3583 matches exactly with archive footage taken at the mass casualty site at the time that SCP-3583 supposedly visited. However, SCP-3583 itself has never been reported by witnesses at any site or seen in any archive footage of any site. Luckily, SCP-3583 has proven to be a boon to this struggling school district. The school principal noted that SCP-3583 has a better safety record than any human driver. In addition, it never calls in sick and is never late for a pickup or drop-off. Every student that has received a ride in SCP-3583 has arrived safely, if a little shaken, at their home destination. And best of all, SCP-3583 is saving the school a lot of money on both driver pay and vehicle maintenance, money that the school has used to hire a new music teacher. The general consensus of the local community is that as long as SCP-3583 wants to work as a school bus and continues to do a good job, who are they to look a gift horse in the mouth? Although it still might behoove some of SCP-3583's more sensitive riders to shut their eyes and plug their ears until they get safely home. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3583 when students began posting cell phone footage of their rides online. Although the Foundation has successfully scrubbed information about SCP-3583 from the internet, it has been less successful in figuring out what to do with the so-called school bus from hell. Foundation field agents are so far unable to explain SCP-3583's motive or operations. Conventional attempts to contain SCP-3583, such as impounding the bus or towing it to the junkyard, are futile. SCP-3583 will immediately dematerialize, falling apart into a rubble of disparate bus parts as the force binding it together appears to abandon this plane. However, SCP-3583 will always return the next school day, ready and willing to begin its afternoon shift. Agents have considered closing the affected school, but feared that would only move the problem, as SCP-3583 would simply attach itself to another school. The SCP Foundation is currently monitoring the situation and has several agents embedded within the school district posing as regular staff. Because of this immense difficulty in containment, SCP-3583 has been given the Keter Object Class. Considering the number of SCP anomalies that involve horrific bodily harm being done to their victims, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to be dealing with one this seemingly benevolent, a little post-traumatic stress disorder aside, of course. And while Hellbus may be what most around the Foundation have taken to referring to this particular anomaly, I'm going to stick to my own name, the Tragic School Bus. It's October 31st, 2021, and anyone who's anyone in the upper crust of society knows that there's really only one place to celebrate Halloween if you want to stay relevant, a certain Norwegian billionaire's yearly costume ball. Invitations are highly exclusive, and if you have to ask where you can get one, you're definitely not on the list. Those lucky, beautiful, famous, or just plain rich enough to be invited receive the notice a year in advance, in an increasingly elaborate fashion each time. Rumor has it that one year the billionaire specially trained a flock of purebred carrier pigeons to deliver the invites, printed on scrolls recovered from the ruins of the Library of Alexandria. But that's just a rumor, of course. This year's invitations arrived in the form of a luxury sports car, with a simple, gold-embossed card hidden in the glove compartment that read, Lucky You. It then provided information on this year's theme, Medieval Fantasy. The dress code would be strict, and failure to comply would result in being barred from entering the event. It also included a vital piece of carefully guarded information, the location of the party. 
The lavish event is held in the billionaire's castle, nestled in the remote countryside of Norway, which he had built a decade ago specifically for this one night a year. For the other 364 days, it sits vacant, except for a full staff to keep it in prime condition, of course. As a group of first-time partygoers pull up the long, winding driveway to the castle's gates, their limo is stopped by a guard. Your driver will need to let you out here, he explains. Can't have someone who isn't on the list coming up to the residence, your host insists. And so the group, two men and two women, climbs out of the car, and they all make their way up the drive on foot. They didn't prepare for the trek, and by the time they reach the castle gates, the ladies are sweating into their exquisite handmade gowns, and one of the gentlemen has torn a small hole in his tights. Nevertheless, they have arrived at what promises to be a truly grand occasion. Once the gates creak open and grant them admission, they quickly forget the discomfort of the long walk. Reports of the event have not, in fact, been greatly exaggerated. It is every inch as impressive as they could have imagined it would be. A lush golden carpet rolls out from the doors into the ballroom, and a herald clad in period attire blows a horn to signal their arrival. He announces their names to the room, where beautiful people are already dancing and frolicking to their heart's content. There are rows and rows of delicious-looking food, including roasted pigs, fresh fruit, and cakes. There are fountains filled with the finest champagne, and a full orchestra provides live music that fills the enormous halls. Above it all, the host himself sits, dressed in regal robes and a crown positively dripping with jewels. It is the most indulgent, decadent, glorious event any of them have ever been a part of. There are no clocks inside the party castle, and no other way to note the passage of time while inside. This is entirely deliberate, and an event there ends only when the guests have all grown too weary to continue the merriment. It is for this reason that the four newcomers do not notice how late it has grown, or the fact that one day has already bled into the next outside the castle. By the time they stumble back outside, filled with cake, champagne, and fresh gossip they can't wait to repeat, it is nearly dawn. They walk back down the path that led them to the castle, their steps a little heavier with exhaustion and the aforementioned champagne and notice that there are rows of limousines and other cars waiting where they were dropped off. Excuse me, one of the women calls out to a guard. Where's our limo? Where did you tell him to wait? The guard responds. At this, the woman looks at her companions, who all shrug. None of them were aware of this practice, and they sent the driver home when they left the car. We didn't, she explains. The guard stares at her blankly for a moment, then bursts out laughing. Well then, he says, you'll just have to walk. Surely there is a contingency plan in place, right? Their wealthy host can't expect his guests to walk home if they didn't think to plan ahead and tell their driver to wait all night. The group waits for the punchline, the reveal that there is a driver on staff ready to give them a ride or someone who can call them a cab, but it never comes. Not only that, but none of their cell phones have a signal. They can't call the driver to come back, even if he wasn't likely to be dead asleep at this hour. The guard is right, they will have to walk, at least until they have enough of a signal to call for a taxi. So, with no other option in sight, the disillusioned partygoers begin the long journey back to civilization. Light is beginning to trickle back onto the landscape, allowing them to at least see where they are going, but it is still mostly dark as they make their way along the road. Are we safe out here? One of the men asks. From what, muggers? The other replies. There could be bears out here, one of the women remarks. No, the other woman insists. The bears are all hibernating this time of year, aren't they? They all collectively shiver at the thought of encountering a bear or anything else out on this lonely road, with nowhere to hide and no way to defend themselves. Best not to dwell too long on that thought, or they might find themselves paralyzed with fear. They still have who knows how many steps left to go before they can relax. They walk together in silence for a long time, listening for the sound of any dangerous criminals or bears creeping up behind them, but nothing comes. As they slowly progress, the sun begins to emerge on the horizon, flooding the landscape with warm light and chasing away the fear of the dark. Look, one of the ladies finally breaks the silence. Up there! She points, directing her friend's attention to a hill up ahead. There, they can make out the silhouettes of men on horseback, wearing suits of medieval armor. They're dressed as knights, like something out of a King Arthur story. They must have come from the party. The others nod, agreeing. Maybe we could ask for a ride? One of the men suggests. Or to borrow a horse, the other chimes in. In agreement, the four approach the knights in shining armor, waving their arms as they go. Halt! Who goes there? Shouts one of the knights. Oh, there's no need for that, the other woman laughs. We came from the same place. Art thou friend or foe? The knight asks. 
He does not remove his helmet. His hand rests on the hilt of his sword. Thinking it all must be some kind of joke, the group of partiers continues up the hill. Spurred to action, the knight draws his sword, brandishing it threateningly. This is enough to stop the group in their tracks. Is he serious? mutters one woman to the other. I can't tell, she replies. That sword looks pretty real, though. Behind them, they hear the clip-clop of hooves and turn to see two other knights sitting atop massive black horses, brandishing weapons. I think we should go, she yells to her friends, gathering her skirts and running back down the hill, but the rest of the group don't seem so willing to turn back. You want to play a game? Then let's play, says one of the men as he draws his own sword, a perfect replica of one wielded by a character in his favorite fantasy television series, and tries to wave it back at the knight, but he promptly drops it on the grass. It's much heavier than he thought it would be. Leave this place now, or face your death, a voice bellows from above him. Now wait just a minute, who do you think you're talking to? The man says as he bends down to pick his sword up again. But before he can finish, there's a flash of glimmering steel in the sunlight, followed by a spray of dark red liquid that hits the rest of the partygoers. They watch in silent horror as the man's head rolls off his shoulders before looking back at the man on horseback. This isn't a game at all. The blood-stained partygoers turn and run from these frightening strangers on horseback, but they can hear the thunderous hooves following them, the clank of the metal armor. The woman who first began to run looks back over her shoulder and can't believe what she sees. It's a rout as the mounted knights chase their fleeing foes, cutting them down in their retreat. All she can do is run and hope that they're too distracted with their current quarry to come after her. She doesn't know how long she runs before the sound of the massacre starts to fade out, but eventually, it does. Unable to run any longer, she collapses in the grass, frightened and confused by all that has happened. But with a scream, she jumps to her feet once again as she hears footsteps behind her. You can't sleep here, says a man with a harsh barking voice. This is a restricted area. Before her stands the second group of armed men she's seen that day. This time, they're dressed in modern military attire. The Norwegian army? She can't be sure. The man doesn't have an accent. She starts to plead with the man, but he abruptly cuts her off. What year is it? He asks, his expression serious. She answers, confused, giving him the current year. He relaxes. This area is closed to the public. It's not safe for you to be here. Let me escort you out of the perimeter, he offers. She tries to tell him what she's seen, the strange men on horseback, her friends being slaughtered before her eyes. When the man asks how she got there, she lets the whole story come pouring out. The billionaire, the invitation, the party. In her frantic state, she doesn't notice one of the guards who radios to someone that it looks like he's done it again. The man questioning her changes his tone. He doesn't seem at all concerned about a murderous group of medieval knights in the woods. Sounds like you had a bit too much to drink, he tells her before putting a comforting arm around her shoulders. And she doesn't even notice the syringe until she feels a prick on her upper arm before losing consciousness. The woman would be returned home and have no memories of the events that she witnessed. She'd never remember how much danger she was in when she had a brush with SCP-526. SCP-526, also known as the Valhalla Gate, is located on a hill in Norway. The SCP Foundation has hidden information on the gate's exact whereabouts, no doubt to stop curious civilians from wandering into danger or filming short viral videos. But if you find yourself in the Norwegian countryside, it can still easily be identified. Simply look for a ring of nine stones, each standing at about two meters tall, placed in a 10 meter radius at the top of the hill. If you're not certain whether you're in the right place, or if you just happened upon another mysterious stone circle, look for the runes inscribed on the inward surface of each one. If the runes are there, you're in the right place. Or the wrong place, depending on who you ask. Every day at sunrise, give or take about 15 minutes, the gate will open and release a group of warriors from any point in history, fully armed and outfitted for battle. These can range from a small group of archers, to 300 Spartans, to groups of highly trained special operatives, and every member of the temporarily displaced group will be from the same period in history. As if they all ran through some sort of rift at the same time. Though these resulting manifestations rarely harm anyone, staying in place 92% of the time after they first appear on the hilltop, the remaining 8% lead to scenarios which can truly be a bloodbath. After all, to an army lost in the fog of war, emerging in a strange land in an unfamiliar time, anyone can look like an enemy. No matter how they behave on their initial appearance, those who cross through SCP-526 will attempt to attack anyone who approaches the anomaly. They will remain in the area until sunset, at which time they disappear, presumably returning back to wherever and whenever they originated. 
The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-526 after a group of backpackers were hospitalized in the area. They claimed to have been walking through the hills when suddenly they were swarmed by, quote, a bunch of Vikings with axes. Naturally, this drew the attention of Foundation field agents, who soon found the mystical stone circle responsible for the attack. The survivors were given amnestics, and a cover story circulated blaming the claims of Vikings on recreational hallucinogens. Since this first incident, notable encounters between the Foundation and the soldiers traveling through the Temporal Gate have been few and far between, but there have been a few that were designated significant enough to be recorded in the official archives. Four, to be exact. In the 1990s, a member of the Foundation containment team spotted 40 figures making their way down the hill in the dim dawn light. They were holding longbows and swords, weapons at the ready as they made their descent. One member of the team, who it should be noted was on his very first day of containment duty, made the mistake of calling out to the strangers. Gentlemen, please lower your weapons, he called. His request, however polite it may have been, was answered with an arrow to the shoulder. Thankfully, the rest of the team was able to swoop in and settle things before the situation could progress any further. The injured personnel was given prompt medical attention and reassigned to a desk job, where he was much less likely to encounter flying projectiles of any kind. A few years later, the team of Foundation operatives placed at SCP-526 had started to grow complacent. There had not been a violent incident in ages, just a series of very confused people appearing at sunrise and milling around until they vanished at sunset. It seemed that most of the subjects passing through the temporal rift were not as bloodthirsty as one might expect. Then, one operative was startled out of a daydream by the thunk of a stone axe hitting a tree near his head. He and the rest of his team looked up to see a group of 30 men clad in animal skins pouring down the hillside, rushing right for them. In their fists, they held crude weapons carved from stone, their wild eyes, untamed beards, and blood-stained clothing becoming clearer as they grew closer. Fortunately for the SCP Foundation, these cavemen had brought clubs to a semi-automatic rifle fight. They opened fire, and within minutes, not a single hide-clad man was left standing. It was a bit awkward, looking at their fallen bodies for the rest of the day, but the team saw no point in moving them if they were just going to disappear that night anyway. One task force member spent the rest of the day looking at his hands, paranoid he may have shot one of his ancient ancestors and erased himself from the timeline in a back-to-the-future-like fashion. This was, thankfully, not the case. Several more years passed, and the century turned to usher in the new millennia. In the early 2000s, a platoon of 20 Russian soldiers, later identified when a Foundation officer attempted to translate several curses yelled at him by one of the men, materialized, wearing World War II uniforms and carrying rifles consistent with that time period. Most of them did not move from the hill, staying in a defensive position, but a few got a bit too bold and opened fire on the Foundation operatives. The fire was returned in kind, and two men were killed, but the rest were left unharmed for the remainder of the day. The final incident on record is particularly notable because, in this case, the soldiers that appeared did not belong to a particular country's military, nor were they from the distant past. There were 30 men and women, dressed in an uncomfortably recognizable uniform. These were the members of a lost SCP Foundation mobile task force, all killed in action during a field mission several years prior. Wanting to avoid friendly fire, the operatives placed at the site attempted to speak to these MTF members, but they did not respond. Instead, they attacked and would not relent until air support arrived in the form of a Foundation AC-130 gunship, Thor's Hammer, leaving three dead and eleven wounded when the smoke finally cleared. This last encounter raised some difficult questions about the nature of SCP-526 and the mental state of those who passed through it. They seemed unable to recognize their own peers, unable to hear what they were saying. Their instinct to defend SCP-526 from any perceived invaders overrode whatever familiarity or loyalty they might ordinarily have for other Foundation operatives. It was a tragic, disquieting affair, with no clear answers in sight. The SCP Foundation is of course no stranger to terminating its own, but the individual officers present for this incident reported a high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder, and several requested to be given amnestics in order to put a stop to recurring nightmares. The Foundation will not be able to learn more unless more of their own fallen soldiers pass through the gate. Even if they do, it is impossible to say whether they will be able to ask any questions or engage in a dialogue, or whether they will have to gun them down in another round of kill or be killed. Because there is no way to know what each new sunrise at SCP-526 will bring, the SCP Foundation has classified the anomaly as Euclid. As there is no way to move SCP-526 to any official Foundation site, the 15-kilometer radius around the anomaly has been converted into Armed Containment Area 31. The 
cover story for this area is a military weapon testing site, and there is a no-fly zone in effect there. A team of qualified field agents is placed on site in order to observe and neutralize any subjects that emerge from SCP-526. Because all is fair in war and, well, war, the agents placed there are permitted to use deadly force if their lives are threatened or the containment is jeopardized. Thirty minutes before the sun comes up, the containment teams are placed on full alert and will keep their eyes on SCP-526 until the sun has set and all potential threats have disappeared. If a given day's apparitions are too aggressive or too numerous for the teams on the ground to contain, Mobile Task Force Sigma-9, or Valkyries, may assist via airstrike. Since the Foundation has set up its perimeter around SCP-526, no civilians have been harmed. Though the same can't be said for Foundation personnel or the revolving door of strange warriors emerging on the hill, the protocol has been considered successful. I haven't yet been out to see the gate in person myself. I tend to be more of a pacifist. But if I ever do, I'll make sure to bring a shield, a bulletproof vest, and perhaps a full suit of armor. Why not? The best offense is a good defense, I always say. There are no streetlights on this stretch of the old, narrow road which runs through a rural part of West Virginia. A car has gone off the road into a ditch and needs to be pulled out, a common task for this tow truck driver, and he's often in the area doing similar jobs. Though he's never been on this particular road, and he has to keep his eyes peeled for any signs or other markers that might give him an idea of how close he is to his turn. He spots something up ahead, but as he gets closer, he sees that it isn't a road sign, it's a billboard. As he passes by, he can make out the weathered lettering advertising a diner 20 miles down the road that's probably been closed for at least as many years. As he continues driving, he sees more dilapidated billboards, advertising other long-since shuttered businesses like gas stations and auto body shops. But then he sees one on the road ahead of him that's nothing like the others. This one doesn't look old at all, in fact it looks quite new. He drives by and has to question if he saw it correctly. It seemed like all it said was, get away over and over, and then the name of a road. Is that an invitation or a warning? It wasn't even clear what kind of business it might be advertising. He continues driving, but he can't quit thinking about that strange sign. He even feels compelled to turn around so he can get another look at it. But there's no need, because as he rounds a curve, there's another of the same sign. This time he slows down as he passes to get a better look, and he was right. It just says, get away multiple times with the name of a road. Wagriwa Road. Must be Native American or something. Now he really can't get the billboard out of his mind. What does it mean? What is it advertising? And why is there a third one of them just ahead of him? He pulls his truck to the side of the road, stopping with his headlights illuminating the sign. He gets out of the truck and stands in front of the billboard. It's just the same as the others. Get away, written over and over. Wagriwa Road. He can see now that the background of the sign is a picture of some trees on a gray, cloudy winter day. He also notices for the first time that there's another line at the bottom. Find what you are looking for. What does it mean? Find what you're looking for on Wagriwa Road? Where even is that? There's no directions, no address, no phone number. He takes a step back from the sign and looks up and down the darkened road. What is he doing out here on the side of the road? Someone is stranded in a ditch waiting for him and he's staring at a billboard? He gets back into the truck, puts it in gear, and drives away. As he continues down the tree-lined rural road, though, he inevitably finds his thoughts turning back to the signs. Get away. But find what you're looking for? Doesn't make any sense. Or are you supposed to get away to Wagriwa Road? Who would put these up? And why do they look so new? Everything else out here looks like it's for a business that shut down years ago. What are they trying to- <gasps> He suddenly slams on his brakes and comes to a screeching stop in the middle of the road. His eyes are locked on what's in front of him. His headlights aren't lighting up another billboard, though. This time, it is a worn road sign. Wagriwa Road. He can't help it. He has to know what's down this road. He has to know what these signs are about. The stuck driver can wait a few minutes longer. He turns his truck onto the narrow gravel road and drives for a few hundred yards, following it around a couple of bends as it winds through the trees until it abruptly ends. There's nothing out here. No buildings, no signs just what looks to be a dirt path leading deeper into the woods. The tow truck driver switches off the ignition, and the road is plunged into darkness. He reaches under his seat and takes out a flashlight before getting out of the truck. He shines the light into the woods surrounding him, but there's nothing to see. No, wait. There is something, and it's coming down the path out of the trees. Phil? Phil, is that you? The figure that stepped out of the woods is talking to him. He shines his flashlight at them, and they raise a hand to shade their eyes from the light. Sharon, what are you doing out here? 
It's Sharon, the tow truck driver's ex-wife. But he thought she'd moved to Colorado after she remarried. Why would she be here? And what was she doing emerging from the woods? Phil, come here. I need to show you something. He hesitates for just a moment, but then finds that he's walking towards his ex-wife. Before he can reach her, she turns around and starts walking down the path back into the woods, and he follows. He walks just behind her, his flashlight illuminating the path in front of them. He thinks he hears a rustling coming from the woods next to him and searches the trees with his flashlight, but doesn't see anything. Come on, it's just a little further, she says. Where are we going? What's just a little further? What you're looking for? The woods suddenly open up, and he finds that they are standing in a clearing. She stops walking, and he pauses next to her. He opens his mouth to speak, but she quickly shushes him. Quiet, they're almost here. The tow truck driver looks around, but he doesn't see anything, just the faint outline of trees that are barely visible on this moonless night. But then he watches as several creatures begin to emerge out of the woods into the clearing. They're… deer? He watches as just a few come towards him at first, but then he notices that they have completely surrounded him. There must be over twenty. Turn off your light, she tells him. He obeys, and in the darkness he can see now that there is something special about these deer. Their eyes are glowing with a pale white light. One of the smaller deer steps forward and cautiously approaches him. He squats down and holds his hand out, showing it that he means it no harm. The deer looks back nervously at a larger one that he thinks must be its mother. It looks like it nods in approval, and the smaller deer moves closer. He can clearly see its big, beautiful doe eyes glow brightly in the dark. You're okay, he says, and leans forward to give it a reassuring pet when… Following the mysterious disappearances of multiple people in an area of West Virginia near the town of Harper's Ferry, the SCP Foundation soon became interested in a particular stretch of road where it appeared that many of those who had gone missing had traveled just prior to their vanishing. Agents were dispatched to the area and immediately detected high levels of thaumaturgic energy, with the epicenter appearing to be on a plot of privately owned land. Investigation of local records revealed that the land was owned by a man named Richard Redkin. The Foundation staff contacted Mr. Redkin under the guise of being federal agents investigating a crime that had been committed on the property while he was away. Mr. Redkin happily cooperated with the agents, explaining to them that he had never experienced any abnormal events on the property while he was living there, but that he had not resided on the land for some time. Strangely, he claimed to not know the road as Wagriwa Road, insisting that as far as he knew it had never had an official name, being nothing more than a long driveway out to his property. When asked if he could remember anything else abnormal about the location, he told the agents no, but that his daughter had written many fictional stories about strange happenings on the land, and perhaps those had somehow turned into rumors and then urban legends, though that was a long time ago. When the agents requested to meet with the daughter, he explained that it was impossible. She had drowned many years prior in the nearby Shenandoah River. The agents again examined the local records and found that Mr. Redkin wasn't lying. His daughter really had passed away, and her body was found in the river. The timing of this accident was quite coincidental though, as it had occurred exactly one week before the first missing person in the area was reported. Quickly realizing that something was not quite right with this piece of land, the SCP Foundation authorized the purchase from Mr. Redkin, who was more than happy to sell, and a research outpost was constructed to further investigate the anomalous events which had collectively been dubbed SCP-4434. While exploring the surrounding area, they soon found what so many others had before. The bizarre billboards, imploring one to both get away as well as come to Wagriwa Road to find what you are looking for. The signs, which were designated as SCP-4434-A, were found on roads across the West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia tri-state area, but their locations would often change, with the billboards only manifesting for short amounts of time before vanishing and reappearing elsewhere. Bizarrely, when attempts were made to photograph or videotape the signs, the resulting footage would show only a blank, white sign. The Foundation knew that they needed to investigate further, and several experiments were authorized to find just what was happening on the land at the end of the mysterious road. A D-Class personnel, D-84021, was given a radio and implanted with GPS locators in his neck, torso, and thigh, and sent down the road with orders to report back on what they experienced, though unlike the people who had gone missing, he was not shown the billboard prior to entering the area. The D-Class walked to the end of the road, where he reported that a creature was emerging from a path leading into the woods. He soon exclaimed that the creature was a dog that he used to own. The researchers monitoring the test were confused since the dog had apparently been deceased for some time, and yet, here it was standing in front of him. 
Although the D-Class had seemed hesitant at the start of the mission, once he saw his childhood dog, all of his fears were set aside, and he willingly followed it deeper into the forest. After 90 seconds, the D-Class reported that he had entered a clearing and was being surrounded by a group of deer. The reports stopped soon after and were replaced by the sound of screams as D-84021 was attacked and apparently consumed by the deer. Two of the three GPS trackers remained active for the next 40 minutes, and SCP researchers followed their path as they moved to the middle of the clearing and then appeared to enter a sinkhole or cave of some sort, where they traveled slowly in a winding pattern downward until contact was lost. Following this test, the Foundation researchers suspected that the creature that would emerge from the woods, which had been designated as SCP-4434-B, was able to change forms into one that would be trusted by those who entered the 4434 area. The deer, on the other hand, seemed to always maintain their appearance, and the whole group was designated as SCP-4434-C. The tests were far from over, though. For the next, two D-classes were sent into SCP-4434 in order to see what form 4434-B would take when more than one person was present. Just like before, an entity emerged from the woods, but this time, it took the form of a young man in a suit who immediately offered to clear any and all debts the D-Classes held, as well as expunging their criminal records, freeing them from their life as test subjects. All they would need do is follow him into the woods. The agents monitoring the test ordered the D-Classes not to follow the man, but they were ignored, and the researchers listened as they instead began conversing with SCP-4434-B, seeming to be quite interested in his offer. They soon followed him into the woods, and just over two minutes later, they too were attacked and consumed by SCP-4434-C. It appeared now that once someone entered the SCP-4434 area, they were all but helpless to resist the compulsive effects of SCP-4434-B. The Foundation researchers wanted to test the limits of SCP-4434's power, and so they then came up with a rather creative procedure for the next test. Another D-Class personnel was sent down the road, but this one was wearing a body harness that was connected to a pulley system, as well as being equipped with a camera. He was ordered to wait at the edge of the SCP-4434 area until the 4434-B entity appeared. The entity soon emerged, taking the form of a middle-aged woman. As soon as the D-Class was seen conversing with the entity and agreed to follow it, the pulley was engaged in order to forcibly pull him out of the area. This was followed by an entirely unexpected event. The middle-aged woman quickly produced a knife and, with a supernatural speed, severed the rope on the pulley system. The now-free D-Class stood up, followed the woman into the woods, and was consumed soon after. The researchers were growing frustrated with their lack of advancement in understanding the anomaly, and so for the fourth test, they decided to take quite extreme measures. A drone was used to fly over the area, which identified the mouth of the cave that the GPS trackers had been taken into. It was a three and a half meter wide hole in the ground, too dark to see anything past the entrance, and the drone installed an anchor point in the ground at the mouth of the hole before flying in to explore further. But the signal was almost immediately lost. Progress had been made, though. Yet another D-Class was selected, this time one who had climbing experience. D-84041 was warned in advance that the SCP-4434-B entity would appear to her and would have a compulsive effect, and that she was to ignore them no matter what form they took and instead proceed as quickly as possible to the cave, which had been designated as SCP-4434-D. D-84041 was taken to the road, and she immediately began running down the path into the woods. She was able to reach the mouth of the cave without seeing any anomalous entities, neither 4434-B nor the carnivorous deer. She quickly attached the rope she had brought to the anchor that was installed by the drone and began rappelling into the hole. As she descended down, she described the normal, rocky cave one that grew wetter the further down she went. Surprisingly, she soon reached the bottom, where she found a spherical room, roughly eight meters across. But this was not anything like the entrance to the cave. The floor of this room wasn't made of rock or dirt. It was more like flesh, and it appeared to be breathing. And there was something else down there, too. A folded piece of paper with writing on it. The D-Class was ordered to pick up the paper, take a sample of the cave floor, and exit the area as soon as possible, as there was no way to predict if the SCP-4434-B and C entities, or something worse, would soon appear. After taking a sample, she began climbing out of the cave. When she emerged, there were still no signs of any anomalous creatures, but she quickly made her way down the road and out of the SCP-4434 area. When she reached the waiting agents at the edge of the area, D-84041 handed them the sample and the paper that she found but then stopped and turned around. There on the ground, roughly five meters away, was a plate of food. 
Without any hesitation, she walked back into the SCP-4434 area, picked up the plate, and walked back into the woods. She was never seen again. It was now clear that 4434-B could take forms other than just humanoids and animals. As the objects that the D-Class had managed to get out of SCP-4434 were analyzed, the area's former owner, Richard Redkin, was again questioned by Foundation agents. They asked him if there was anything he failed to mention in their previous interview, and he told them that there was one thing that he preferred not to normally discuss. Just before his daughter's death, in addition to her fascination with writing and coming up with stories, she had become obsessed with the occult. When they asked him about the paper they had found within SCP-4434-D, he told them that it was very likely that she had written it. The SCP Foundation now understood why they had detected so many thaumaturgic particles in the area, which is the residual energy left over from a particular form of ritualistic practice that is more commonly known as magic or witchcraft. The contents of the paper found in the cave seemed to add additional weight to the theory that his daughter may have been involved in a ritual that led to the creation of SCP-4434, because written on the single page is a poem which reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish, and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down, and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. Things only became more mysterious, though, when Foundation researchers performed a DNA test on the sample taken from the bottom of the SCP-4434-D cave. What they found was that it was, just as D84041 had described, a flesh-like substance, and that it was a 78.9% match to Melanocetus johnsoni, better known as the deep-sea anglerfish. And there was one final discovery to be made as well. Linguistic teams within the Foundation investigated the name of the road that had appeared on the SCP-4434-A billboards, and discovered that the word was very similar to the Native American Tutelo tribe word Wagriwa, which roughly translates to the phrase, I have come back. Just a little further, your friend says. They're leading your group, and as you all emerge from the woods, your flashlight illuminates a tall chain-link fence with barbed wire strung across the top. How are you supposed to get over that? Another of your friends asks, and the group's leader has just the answer. They point their flashlight several yards down, where you see a large pine tree that has fallen over onto the fence, creating a bridge that you should be able to shimmy along to get over the barrier. You and your group of friends take turns climbing over the toppled tree before dropping down on the other side of the tall fence. After dusting yourselves off, your group walks further into the clearing until you come to an old set of railroad tracks that are rusty and look like they haven't been used in some time. Well, one of your more incredulous friends asks, what's supposed to happen? The group's leader explains that if we're lucky, we'll see it. See what? The ghost light. They go on to explain that on certain nights, a mysterious light will appear in this very clearing, wandering the area around the railroad tracks. What is it? You ask. Your friend tells you that many years ago, maybe a hundred or more, this was once a bustling and busy stretch of railroad. One night, a Union Pacific worker came out to check a portion of the tracks that were supposedly damaged. The worker went out into the night with his dim lantern, and he walked along the tracks until he stopped in this very clearing. He spotted what looked to be damage to one of the rails and bent down to examine it. No one knows why he didn't hear the train barreling towards him or hear its whistle cry out in the night, but the man would never hear anything again, as BAM! The train took his head clean off. Now, with only his lantern to guide him in the night, the headless railway worker wanders this clearing, still searching for his missing head. That's a stupid story, one of your friends says. How could someone not notice an entire train? I don't know, but it's true. No, it isn't. As the two go back and forth, you suddenly notice something in the distance. Um, hey, look over there. Everyone follows the direction you're pointing and sees it. A dim ball of light hanging in the air. See, your friend says. I told you it was true. He steps towards the ball of light. And as he does, it actually moves, drifting back at the same rate he comes forward, as if to maintain the exact same distance. When your friend takes a step back, the light moves just the same. Look, over there, you say. Another one. What's going on? Were these the ghosts of multiple headless rail workers, all searching for their missing craniums? This light is brighter than the other, though. And rather than maintaining a set distance from your group, 
It's slowly moving towards you. What do we do? One asks. I don't know, the leader says. I've never dealt with a ghost before. The light continues to move towards your group, and no one knows what to do. Frozen in fear, you watch as the light passes straight through you, and your friends start to scream as it is absorbed into your chest. Their cries become muffled, though, sounding to you as if they're underwater. Your hearing isn't the only thing that feels that way. Your whole body suddenly feels as though you're submerged in liquid. You can't breathe, and you thrash at the air, trying to swim, but nothing is there. You scream and choke and fall to the ground as the ball of light passes through you like you weren't even there, leaving you in the dirt gasping for breath. Your friends rush over to help you up, asking what happened, but there's no time to explain because two even bigger, brighter lights have appeared. You're terrified of what they might do to you, but before you can even think about running, a voice calls out from the darkness. Stop right there! The two big balls of light are headlights attached to the front of a black SUV, and a pair of angry-looking armed guards have just gotten out of it. The last thing you hear is one of the men say, I can't believe we have to deal with this, before you feel the sting of a dart hitting your thigh and your vision goes black. You open your eyes to find that you're sitting in your own car with your group of friends. They too appear to have been asleep and are just waking. You're parked on the side of the road next to a thick forest of pine trees, and the sun is just starting to rise. What were we supposed to do again? One of your friends asks from the back seat. I don't remember, you say, but the sun's coming up. Let's get out of here. And you drive your group of friends back home with no memory of the previous night's events. This group of teens was quite lucky. What they thought was little more than an urban legend known as the Gurdon Lights was actually a mysterious and dangerous anomaly which the SCP Foundation knows much better as SCP-2640. SCP-2640 is a temporal anomaly that is found within a 5,000 square meter area near the town of Gurdon, Arkansas. The area is densely covered with pine trees, with the only man-made object found within it being a set of railroad tracks that bisect the area. Of most interest within SCP-2640, though, are the strange entities that manifest inside. Designated as SCP-2640-1, these entities are floating orbs of light that are capable of appearing alone or in groups, though no more than 12 at once have ever been observed manifesting at the same time. Their light will vary in intensity, from 75 to 450 lux, which is roughly equivalent to the range of light produced by standard light bulbs, and the color is always a bluish-white. The lights will normally be seen to travel slowly within SCP-2640, though they have been observed moving quite quickly on occasion, with the quickest ones having been measured traveling at speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour. There is also a connection between the luminosity of the entities and their behavior. Those measured at less than 150 lux will not interact with humans, instead maintaining a distance of at least 20 meters from the nearest observer at all times. Attempts to move closer will lead to the entity moving away at the same rate, ensuring that it maintains the same 20 meters of distance at all times. On the opposite end of the scale, those that are closer to 450 lux are very active and will approach and even interact with humans. In some instances, the brighter SCP-2640-1 entities will actually pass through solid objects, including people, which leads to a very strange sensation for the person involved. When this has occurred, the subject has described a sensation of being suspended in liquid or floating in a swimming pool, despite there being no outward physical changes to them. This feeling of being in water will start the moment a 2640-1 entity makes contact with their body and will cease once it is no longer touching them. The SCP-2640-1 entities appear bound to the SCP-2640 area, and any that approach the boundaries will slowly dim until they disappear completely. In order to better understand the nature of SCP-2640, and specifically the 2640-1 entities found within, an expedition into the area using D-Class personnel was authorized. The three Class Ds were equipped with special equipment capable of measuring the relative reality distortion in a given area, and told to follow along the railroad tracks that run within SCP-2640, with orders to report anything they experienced that was out of the ordinary. As they progressed deeper into SCP-2640, their equipment detected significant reality distorting effects, and just as they did, the SCP-2640-1 entities began appearing. Despite being quite scared of what they perceived as ghosts, the Class D personnel were under strict orders not to run. The 2640-1 that was on the brighter end of the scale approached one of the D-Classes and passed through his body, leading him to experiencing the sensation of being underwater and, since he was unable to swim, made him believe that he might drown. 
the entity passed harmlessly through him and he was left with no lasting injuries, at least not any physical ones. After this test, and given the extremely high reality distorting effects that were detected in the area, it was theorized by researcher Dr. Connors that SCP-2640 might be one of the strongest temporal anomalies on the planet. His report goes on to hypothesize that SCP-2640-1 are actually life forms from another time period that we can see visually, due to this anomaly, yet cannot interact with lest we cause irreparable damage to the time-space continuum. Dr. Connors also noted that the area of SCP-2640 appeared to be slowly growing, and in order to prevent further spread, the installation of several Zyank Anastasikos constant temporal sinks, or exacts, was authorized. And it was a good thing that the exacts were installed, because there was soon an incident that would prove how necessary they are. In a debriefing after said event with Tony Hargrove, a level 3 tech support staff, the SCP Foundation learned a horrifying reality about the true nature of SCP-2640. Mr. Hargrove explained that he was sent into SCP-2640 in order to assess the damage to the Foundation assets after a major tornado had passed through the area. He explained that while power was still running to the site, one of the exacts had been damaged and needed to be replaced, so a maintenance team was sent to install a spare that was kept on site. As the maintenance team approached the area where the exacts was no longer functioning, they reported that there were numerous 2640-1 instances out, more than they had ever seen before, and a higher concentration of the brighter instances than usual. Soon after they reported this, Hargrove lost contact with the maintenance team and decided to go investigate himself. As he entered the SCP-2640 area, he saw something that he had never seen before. There weren't just a few more instances of 2640-1s than normal, but hundreds, maybe even thousands, floating all around him. There were so many that they lit up the sky to the point where he didn't even need a flashlight. Hargrove followed the same railroad tracks that the maintenance team had, and after walking several hundred meters, he spotted something in the mud next to the tracks. It was the replacement temporal sink that they were supposed to be installing, and there was blood on it. He realized that there wasn't just blood on the machine, but it was everywhere, covering the ground all around him. Then he saw something else, an SCP-2640-1 instance near him, but different somehow. I can't remember how I first saw it, he said. Right behind the orbs, there was this spot where the rain just wasn't. Like it was bending around some invisible mass, some, some great thing behind each orb. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Hargrove tried to step back away from the creature and fell into a ditch next to the tracks, clutching the exacts in his arms as the creature seemed to swim towards him. As he lay as still as he could in the ditch, he got the sense that this 2640-1 instance wasn't just randomly moving towards him, it was looking for him. As the void where the rain ceased to be swam over him through the air, he attempted to lie as still as he could, still holding tightly to the exacts. The SCP-2640-1 instance turned and circled over him, like a shark searching for its prey in a cloud of blood, before gliding away into the trees. At that moment, Hargrove knew that the SCP-2640-1 entities weren't what the Foundation thought they were. These weren't just beautiful balls of light that danced and played in the darkness, they were something else, something horrible, something dangerous. He knew that his maintenance team would never be found and that the ditch he was lying in that was slowly filling with rainwater was mixed with their blood. The SCP-2640-1s were hunting them, and they never had any idea. Hargrove knew what he had to do. He crawled through the ditch, stopping any time a 2640-1 got near to him, holding his breath until long after it passed. It took hours of inching along on his belly in the water and mud until he finally reached the point where the damage exacts was located. He managed to get the new temporal sink online, and as it powered on, he watched as the 2640-1 lights around him slowly started to fade and then disappear once again. The deaths of the four Foundation personnel who were on the maintenance team, as well as six other civilians who were killed, were attributed to the tornado, and Mr. Hargrove requested that he be administered a Class B amnestic and reassigned to a new location, both of which are pending approval. The rail line that runs into SCP-2640 has been decommissioned, and a 3 meter tall electrified fence has been erected around the entirety of the area in order to prevent civilians from approaching. No fewer than 8 Zyank Anastikos constant temporal sinks are placed in the surrounding area in order to prevent the further spread of SCP-2640, and a subterranean miniaturized pressurized water reactor has been installed on site in order to provide constant, uninterrupted power. 
the Disinformation Bureau has an ongoing dissemination campaign to further the notion that the SCP-2640-1 lights are nothing more than an urban legend, and should any civilians manage to witness them, they are administered Class B amnestics in order to keep this Euclid-class anomaly a secret. Just what is the true nature of SCP-2640? And perhaps more importantly, SCP-2640-1? Is the breach of our reality a look into the past when this area was covered by an ancient ocean? Or a glimpse into the future when the seas have swallowed it once again? No matter which is the answer, the reality is that there is something there now, something that has managed to pierce the veil of time and make us its prey. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybell is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Mary Bell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Mary Bell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her, and in one deft motion, scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe. And in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size no taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again, he feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame, it's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's… No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale, deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um, 
We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another, a tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin, way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, 
The little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybelle was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a… oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It… but it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he? The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. 
The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Mary Bell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually. But she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Mary Bell whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Mary Bell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe. Mary Bell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. There's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Mary Bell at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, 
follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. The young woman looked again at her map, turning it this way and that, trying to figure out which way she should be going. Excuse me, sir? She calls out to a passing man, but he pays her no mind. A woman walks past and stops when the woman tries her hand at the local language. Bud, um, Laska? Da? The woman asks her. Vi. Uh, Rosmovleete. Uh. Anliskoyu? Yet, the woman replies before continuing on her way. The young woman feels that this is hopeless. Outside of a few phrases like hello, goodbye, and where is the bathroom, her local language skills are sorely lacking. She's still at the beginning of her grand trip of Europe that saw her starting on the eastern side of the continent with the plan to travel westward and finish her journey in Paris. She's traveled a bit before, but here in this Ukrainian city, she's realizing that she may be out of her comfort zone. This trip is very important to her, though. 
After her parents were killed in a car wreck, she was paralyzed with grief and barely left her room for months. She decided that she needed to get away and give herself a clean break from everything back home, and so she decided to do what her parents had done when they were her age and backpack across Europe. All of the pictures from their trip showed the two of them together, smiling and happy in front of great landmarks. But here she was, alone, scared, and unable to even find her hostel. Sir, can you help me? She cries to another passing man, waving her map towards him. But he too ignores her pleas. The young woman zips up her jacket. It's getting late, and the setting of the sun is accompanied by a cold breeze. She looks up and down the city street, and even though there are still plenty of people around, it feels as though all she can see are unfriendly faces. Her face lights up when she spots something, though. It's a police officer. He'll be able to help her. The young woman runs towards the police officer who is standing near the side of the road, or at least she thinks he must be a police officer. His gray uniform looks a little old-fashioned, but it's neat and well-fitting, and he's holding what appears to be a baton used for directing traffic. The young woman approaches the officer, but his back is to her as he gazes out towards the street. Unsure of what else to do, she reaches out with some hesitancy and taps the man on the shoulder, causing him to wheel around to face her. He stares at her without speaking. Um, do you speak English? The young woman asks. Yes, little, he responds in a thick Ukrainian accent. Oh, thank goodness. You have to help me, please. I'm completely lost and I don't know what to do. As people continue to walk past her without giving any notice, she goes on to explain that after arriving in the northeastern Ukrainian city, she took what she thought would be the right bus, but ended up going in the completely wrong direction. Now she has no idea where she is and is worried she won't make it to her hostel before night falls. Where is your hostel? The policeman asks. Somewhere called the... She looks down at the words scribbled on the margins of her map. The student... Uh, the student Skaya? She tells him. Ah, yes, yes, the police officer says. There are many hostels there, including some specifically for foreign visitors and students. She has been very unlucky, though, since it was actually near the metro station she first arrived at. He can help her get there, though. There is a bus that will take her straight there, and the stop is only a few blocks away. He can walk with her there if she likes. The young woman accepts his kind offer, and the two start heading down the sidewalk together. As they walk, he asks what she is doing in their city, and she explains how she just needed to get away and see the world. She's unsure why, but she feels like she can confide in this policeman, and she begins to explain what happened to her parents, how alone she felt at home, and how this trip is meant to be a life reset, but so far, it's off to a terrible start. We have friends, he tells her. Sigda moja boitoja. What does that mean? She asks. It can always get worse. This way. The police officer points towards an alleyway and starts walking towards it. He can tell the young woman is feeling apprehensive about entering the dark space between the buildings, and he assures her that it is a shortcut, there's nothing to be afraid of. The two walk into the alley together. The young woman again starts telling him about her life back in the United States, what she plans to do when she gets back, how she hopes the trip will be a turning point for her. As she talks, she fails to notice that the police officer has begun to slow. She does notice, though that the shadow of the police officer has suddenly started to stretch out on the ground in front of her. She stops and watches as the shadow keeps moving, growing larger and larger. It stretches and lengthens, even as hers stays the same. She also realizes that the sound of the policeman's footsteps have also stopped. She slowly turns to see it standing in the place where the police officer should be. A grotesque, horrible sight. A massively tall creature with long, disgusting limbs. She's too scared to scream as she continues looking up its gigantic body before finally looking at its face, or what's left of it. Half of its jaw hangs unhinged as if it has been torn from its joint, and it has no ears or nose. She trembles in fear as she wonders if whatever this thing is can see her, since it also has no eyes. The last thing she sees before she turns to run is the creature lifting up one of its arms where its hand has been replaced by a black and white metal rod that it brings down with terrifying speed and crushes her skull. Privit! Today's file exploration has taken us to Ukraine, though the anomaly known as SCP-1366-RU has been known to appear in a number of other countries as well. SCP-1366-RU is a humanoid creature that, from what the SCP Foundation has been able to observe, appears to be sapient and resembles a police officer or militia from the 1970s Soviet Union. It wears a long, dark gray coat, tall black leather boots, and a cap and holds a black and white baton reminiscent of the type used by police officers in Russia and many Eastern European countries to direct traffic. 
When an individual begins interacting with SCP-1366-RU, they will find that they feel as if they are talking to a regular police officer and having a completely normal conversation. It is capable of exerting a mental influence over the person speaking with them, allowing it to easily mislead and deceive them, which explains why they ignore the fact that the officer is wearing a uniform that is several decades out of date. Those who pass by will not seem to notice the anachronistic clothing either, and they will pay no mind to what is happening. This same effect extends to those viewing SCP-1366-RU on a live feed, and it is only when recordings are viewed that its true form is revealed. SCP-1366-RU's actual appearance is that of a mummified human corpse, though it is taller than any human at over 5 meters in height, with arms and legs that are disproportionately long, with the legs alone making up two-thirds of its total height. SCP-1366-RU is also extremely skinny, even for a desiccated cadaver, and its limbs and head look as though they are nothing more than brown, dry skin stretched directly over bones, with no muscle at all underneath. Its left hand appears to be missing, and in its place, the creature has a black and white rod fused directly into its arm. 1366RU's face appears as though it has suffered tremendous injuries. Its eyes, nose, and ears all look as if they have been removed from its face, and the left half of its lower jaw hangs freely in its joint as though it were torn away. Despite this damage to its face, it is still quite capable of speech, at least when people are perceiving it in its human form. It's currently unknown why, but SCP-1366-RU appears to be primarily interested in kidnapping and killing people who are in countries that once belonged to the former Soviet Union. So far, there has been no commonalities between the victims except for one thing. All of their parents were dead at the time of their abduction. Once the Foundation realized this uniting factor, they were able to create a scenario in which the anomaly appeared, though so far, this has only been successful one time. Foundation researchers located a member of Class D personnel who was an orphan, D-1935, and equipped them with a radio headset, a video camera, and a microphone, and instructed them to walk the streets of a city located in a country which was once part of the USSR. The D-Class was observed on location by members of MTF-8-10, nicknamed See No Evil, and they watched as D-1935 suddenly stopped on the sidewalk. He was approached by a police officer with an out-of-date uniform who saluted the D-Class with his right hand. Eta-10 appeared to not see the police officer and reminded the D-Class to stay sharp and continue looking for 1366-RU. The police officer spoke to the D-Class, though only in mumbled, broken words, as if something had rendered him unable to speak. The recording equipment captured the D-Class seeming to have a one-sided conversation with the policeman, where he insisted that he wasn't lost and that he was actually out walking with his mother. Or rather, he thought he was out with his mother. It seemed to the D-Class that she had just left and he requested the police officer's help in finding her again. The officer then took the D-Class's hand and began leading him away, eventually taking him into a dark alley. All the while, Eta-10 seemed completely oblivious to what was going on. They didn't even realize that D-1935 had left until the two disappeared into the alleyway. They began searching the area, but they were unable to locate the D-Class anywhere. It was as if he had been there one moment and then simply disappeared. Luckily, D-1935 had also been equipped with a GPS tracking beacon, but when Eta-10 looked at their locator, they were convinced something was wrong, since it showed that the D-Class was now over 5,000 kilometers away. A nearby containment team was sent to the location being broadcast from D-1935's tracker, and they arrived roughly two hours after his disappearance. When they got to the location, they discovered that it was coming from a very strange place, a cemetery. The team cautiously entered the cemetery and began making their way in the direction of the beacon, unaware of what they would find. When the GPS locator finally signaled that they were in the correct position, they realized that they were standing directly over a grave. Specifically, a grave belonging to the mother of D-1935, who had been dead for over 50 years. There was no question though, this was the location the beacon was broadcasting from, and after receiving permission from the Foundation, the containment team began to dig. When the coffin was finally revealed, the team readied their weapons, unsure of what they might find inside. But when they opened its lid, they saw that their guns weren't necessary. All that was found within was the mummified body of a woman. That and the body of D-1935, who was curled up in the fetal position, tightly hugging the remains of his mother. Following this event, the parents of other suspected SCP-1366-RU victims were exhumed as well, and in each case, the missing person's body was found inside alongside their deceased mother or father. 
SCP-1366-RU, which has been given the nickname Uncle Stiopa, a play on a popular Russian children's character who is an extremely tall policeman, has so far eluded all containment attempts, and it has been classified as Euclid. Disappearances of those without living parents in former Soviet Union countries should be investigated to determine the involvement of SCP-1366-RU. Any recording devices in the area where they disappeared must be checked, and should they contain any images of SCP-1366-RU's true form, then they are to be immediately confiscated and destroyed. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1098-RU, the theater of living puppets, for another anomaly from the Russian SCP Foundation, and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.